Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. She is a wife and a mother, an Emmy Award winning journalist to include the DuPont Award for her work in Afghanistan. She's most famous for the many years she has spent at 60 Minutes, including interviewing me for the special. She can drink me under the table and swears enough to make my former teammates blush, and Barbara (laughs) Walters dresses up for her for fucking Halloween. Welcome to the stage, ladies and gentlemen, Laura Logan. Thanks, Mike. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me into your home. It's it's an amazing place to be, and uh, we were just talking... Before we got started, to me, the, the irony and just uh, the, the duality or the, the weird factor, I guess, of uh, six years ago, almost to the day, actually. I mean, because wow. it was about this time six years ago uh, for the 60 Minutes piece where you were in my house interviewing me. And so to, yes. to be able to do that is, is beyond an honor, frankly. So I, I really can't thank you enough for having us down here and, and being able to do this with you. And just before I did this, um, I was... Did an event, and I, and one of the guys who came up to me afterwards at the event said, "Guess what? His favorite story of all time was of mine on sixty minutes." It couldn't have been mine. It was no shit. Seriously, really? which really made me laugh because I knew I was about to yeah, see you. That's you know? crazy. And I know. That was, uh, the event you just did. Yeah. No oh, shit. That's awesome. <laughs> that's yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a crazy turn of events, and uh, you know, again, it's just uh, it's, it's pretty surreal to be uh, to be interviewing you. So I appreciate you letting us come do it. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I like to throw out a couple of just uh, you know kind of stupid questions uh, to get the ball rolling. Not that you need to be uh, uh, broken in or, or anything like that, but uh, you know I like to provide a little bit of backstory for the listener because we do have kind of a wide swath. Whether it's a fucking, for all the people who have absolutely no idea who I am, me, I, I think most people do. But uh, <laughs> but you know there's whether it's a beta male or a Mormon grandmother listening, uh, you know people like to hear weird shit. So, uh, what is your favorite be- breakfast dish? Bacon. Bacon by itself. I had to have a pound of bacon every day. Oh shit! Yeah, and I stopped my morning with a Bailey's coffee. Really? My family think I, I have a problem, but <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's my husband makes that for me every morning. Yeah, Joe, we're gonna need uh, maybe a round of those to get started. <laughs> uh, worst hangover you've ever had? Oh, poof. wow! I, so I am an enthusiastic drinker and not a very talented one. Hmm. So it doesn't take much to put me in the ICU. Do <laughs> <laughs> so you got a lot of them? Oh, yes. Well, I mean, you know, I didn't actually start drinking till I was like 37. I mean, I had a couple of, you know, crazy nights, yeah. but um, I wasn't much of a drinker at all because mm. I, was, I was always that girl that everyone thought was drunk yeah. when we were, <clears throat> I don't know, <laughs> flashing our boobs out the car window or taking our clothes off and skinny dipping. But I did all of that sober growing yeah. up. I never needed... I never needed to be uh, drunk to uh, to go nuts. So it was always like an easy <laughs> yeah. decision for me, yeah. and um, and I wasn't self conscious, you know. Yeah. So I just didn't I just didn't give a shit basically, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and also I hated being hungover because like I was always a person who wanted to tear the day to pieces, you yeah. know. And the and the thought of staggering around, you know, with a headache. Was uh, seemed just so pointless to me. Yeah. So um, I really, uh, my worst hangover, sure, Mike. There's been a couple times that I would rather not <laughs> remember. <laughs> no, you want to talk about? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's I'm a blur. Sure. I'm right there with you. Uh, and that's just this week, for Christ's sake. Uh, <laughs> what's the most embarrassing thing that your that one of your children has ever done? Well, while you're there. Ah. Uh, and the most embarrassing thing, my children, not to me, though, just embarrassing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it could be anywhere. You're, you're somewhere with your kids or, or whatever, and they embarrass the shit out of it. Because I've got about a million stories with mine. But You know, it takes a lot to embarrass me, i got to yeah. say. And, and I also usually don't care a lot what other people think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, it, the one thing that my daughter did to my husband once when I was in hospital um, uh, in the years after Egypt when I had a, a number of... Uh, health issues after um, being attacked there. And um, Joe brought the kids to come and see me in hospital. And when they got in the elevator, as they were leaving, this um, very large individual got into the elevator. And so my daughter, in her loudest whisper, said to her brother, Joe, what did she say, Joe? 
Her butt is huge. Which really is nowhere to go from that. Yeah, you couldn't yeah. cover that. So I think he, I remember him saying, Lola, Lola. And, he, and she said, what? It is. Yeah. yeah so we've, you know, we, we had a long conversation after yeah. that particular How, event. He phoned me by the time yeah. the elevator had hit the ground floor and the, other, and the woman was out of earshot. He was like, you will not believe what Lola just did to me. Yeah. What, <laughs> how, how old was she at that time? Four or five? Yeah. Four. She was four. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. uh, mine have cussed as bad as I have in front of, in front of strangers. I mean, get, Oh, yeah, that doesn't embarrass me. Yeah. Mine do yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> you me, said I, embarrassing I, story, I, I Mike. To, to me as a dad and especially as a former SEAL, people are looking at me like, that's fucking great. Like you got a daughter that's swearing. I would but, just not be surprised. Yeah. That your daughter swears. No, uh, uh, yeah. She, uh, and people would be shocked if mine didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so not being from this country, what are, uh, what are three things that you love about the U.S.? Um, well, I really love uh, the U.S. because otherwise, you know, I wouldn't, I, I gave up a lot not to be in, in, a, in South Africa because it's, it's a big thing to me, you know. Mm -hmm. I really love South Africa and I'm very much... Uh, still an African at heart, but um, but I'm also I think just instinctively American at heart too because the thing that uh, is most important to me about this place and and about life is freedom. Yeah, you know that's uh, that's everything. And and when I was growing up in South Africa to watch and listen to people like Nelson Mandela and to be in a you know in a rally with. 50, 60, 80, 100,000 people and feel the ground move, you know, when they toy toy, which is an African answer for freedom. Like, that's the thing that is just most synonymous with America for me. And my friend uh, Jewel, the uh, singer, who some of you listening to this may know, who's just one of the most spectacular women I've ever met in my life, Jewel said to me on the phone the other day, you know, nobody, freedom is in you. Nobody can take it from you or give it to you. And I thought about how true that is. So this uh, America for me is the place that flies the flag for freedom. There's lots of, you know, freedom can be found anywhere. But um, what's so important about this faith, this place and this country is that it's a defining thing, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. And uh, so above all, I mean, I am freedom I have always been free. I don't, nobody owns me, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever going to own me, for better or worse. I don't, I, you know, the greatest thing in my life to work for 60 minutes professionally, but I don't really work for 60 minutes, right? I work for something independent of all of that. I work for the truth. Like, that's what I'm always trying to find. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who I work for. So freedom is just such a fundamental thing for me. It's just, it's so important. And, you know, that's how... A man like Nelson Mandela can, at his trial for treason, can say, you know, convict me innocent or, you know, guilty, whatever you find me. Like, this is what I represent. If he said uh, that freedom in, in the courtroom at his, the Ravonia terrorism trial, where the South African government really wanted to sentence Mandela to death, he stood there and said that he was fighting for freedom. And he said, it's an ideal I want to live for but it's an ideal for which I'm prepared to die. Mm -hmm. Well, there's nothing more free than a man with no control over w the decision that's about to be made over yeah. his life to have the freedom to say that and mm -hmm. mean it, right? Absolutely. So it's such a big thing for me. It's in, it guides me. It's inspired me. It's in every fiber of my being. And uh, there is no country on earth that is more symbolic of that ideal and whose example has been a light for so many. So there's, you know, I know there's lots of criticism and much of it valid and some of it not that you can uh, point towards the U.S. But that, that thing and what the U.S. has done to inspire and, and uh, sometimes lead, not always for that. That's what I love about America. Then I love, what else do I love? Well, my children are born here. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this place for me gave me you know, my children and were well, the most important thing in my life and my husband and my family and and it's my home. So I love that. But I think, you know, if you want a list of, well, I love things I love that are truly American. I love, 
I love uh, tacos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love tacos. I love blue jeans. Yeah. I love Johnny Cash. Yeah. <laughs> I love Luke and Buck, Texas. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I could give you uh, 20 more things. I know I've already answered the question and I probably took too long. No. But that's, and what I love too about the US, I love that the US is almost like a different country everywhere you go. Yeah. And I love that people think they got everything figured out. And you know, every time I sit down with someone else, whether it's in Northern California or, you know, bumfuck country, mm-hmm. town somewhere. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. wait, like this one. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Uh, this place constantly surprises me and I'm always discovering something else. That's, yeah. uh, that's a great thing to me. I mean, to me, to, to hear that answer is, uh, is, is, for me, amazing because I think, especially having been all over the world and, and uh, interacted with a lot of people who aren't from here or, or have never been here, um, you know, and, and seeing the contrast that takes place with most people that are from here but have never been away from here is that, there's so many things they don't understand how lucky they have it. And, and there's a lot of people that really fucking take it for granted. Um, you know, and, and to hear the way that you, you reduce it down to something that's so, uh, simplistic, but woven into the fabric of our society, you know, from its inception, uh, you know, and, and to both realize uh, and appreciate it the way you do is, is, is both remarkable and refreshing because you just don't hear it put that way very often either. So, uh, I, you know, I appreciate you sharing it. It's, it's fucking great. Um, one thing I like to ask everybody, especially, um, people that are busy, how they manage their time. I mean, to me, that's, that's kind of the, uh, the textbook principle of how people (laughs) get, get successful is, is they're, they're efficient. I mean, whether, you know, wrong, right, or indifferent, like you you can't get to where you're at, or most of the people that I, that I interview wouldn't be where they're at if they didn't have some, some assemblance of their shit together when it comes to time management. So I always like to ask people what their morning routine is. Uh, oh my word. G- given given uh, you know you're not traveling just a yeah. norm- normal day around here what is what is uh, your your morning look like oh my gosh so you hit the one thing that I'm like that I really suck at because um, I'm always late I'm yeah. notorious for always being late and it's a combination I think of the fact that I I I try to do everything I do properly I always have that's in my nature I hate I hate people who do things. I hate it when people do things, you know, they don't do it properly. Mm -hmm. I don't understand. If you're not going to do it properly, just don't fucking do it. Okay? Just get the fuck out of my way because you just wasted my time. Mm -hmm. If I got to do what, finish what you did, and now why did I bother? Like, it's because now on top of the fact that I still got to do it, now I'm pissed. Mm -hmm. So so for me, you know, uh, I try to do everything properly. I try to do it. Um, as uh, the best that I can, and I try to get it all done. I'm not someone who it has to be me if I don't do it. It's not going to be no. The better you are at, at everything, the better, the happier I am. So on a on a day when I'm not traveling, I am uh, I have to get up with my kids and get them to school. They got to be fed, and they got to have lunch. And also, have I read all those things? notices from school and is the homework all in order and all of that stuff. So as everyone who's ever had kids knows, getting them out the door in the morning is the first achievement. Actually, waking up is the first achievement. (laughs) Getting your your own ass out of bed. Because I'm not a morning person. And also what I do is when everyone's asleep, I work, you know, and I can stay up for hours. Um, So that's sometimes rough. But, um, But it's funny that you say, no one gets, you know, to do all this kind of stuff without having some degree of efficiency, right? Mm-hmm. Because someone said to me just the other day, you know, uh, I said I was not disciplined at all. And they said, yes, you are. You know, there's no way you did all of this without having a degree of discipline. And I guess that's true. But <clears throat> to me, um, I'm always conscious of what I'm not doing well yeah. and what I need to do better and what I need, you know. So I would never think of myself as disciplined or efficient, but what I do use a lot is I like lists. Yeah, I'm a list person. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I noticed even in the kitchen you got lists. And uh, yes. all over the place. Yeah. Yes, and uh, my husband will tell you I do lists for him, yeah. I don't doubt it. <laughs> which he doesn't like. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think any of them do. No, yeah. no. Yeah. So uh, that's what I would say. That's the one thing that keeps me <clears throat> grounded is a list, at least something to go back to. 
I can't remember anything I see on my digital calendar. Yeah. I do not know why. Maybe it's because the act of writing it down is how my brain really functions. No, 100%. I mean, that's why I have a notebook instead of reading it off of a tablet or a yeah. phone or whatever. I, I write the uh, same We're time. old. Yeah. I was yeah. going to say we're old school, Mike, but let's <laughs> face it, we're just old. Yeah. I, I'll take the old school. But the uh, the efficiency thing, I mean, I, I guess the, the thing that sticks out to me that you mentioned was that you, you always feel like you're either not efficient or, or you're focusing on the things you could do better. I mean, to me... Again, that's that's a personality trait I think that separates people that are successful versus people that are that are satisfied with the fucking status quo. They're like, yeah, it's good enough. Like the people that yeah. that think shit's good enough stay in the same lot in life, you know. So I mean, to me, and I'm, I've tried to be. I've tried obviously as I've you know you, once you live a little. I mean, I'm yeah. 47 now, 48 this next month. Um, I I try not to be such a perfectionist that I create an impossible standard where everyone always feels like they're failing yeah. and and torture myself. Do you know mm. what I mean? I'm not yeah. stupid about sure. it and I'm not um, unreasonable about it. I've had to learn how to let uh, stuff go. True. So if you know that you've done it the best that you can do it in that moment and that it's going to work and if you and that you make it, you know, you make a conscious decision that you've got to, you know, all these other things to do to that level as well. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's what it, it means to me. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't mean every single thing has to be perfect. And if it's not perfect, I come apart, sure. which I think is an important distinction because I see it with my son. Yeah. He likes everything to be perfect, like, you know, like OCD perfectionist, tiny bit. Yeah. 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 So I, I, and I'm, so I'm aware of not, you know, I'm aware of that because I don't want him to live the kind of life where he doesn't get a whole lot done because he's always trying to do it perfectly. Sure. Yeah. Like I was terrible at drawing because I wanted my drawings to be perfect. And I spent so long trying to get them done. Everyone was always, the art project was over and I was still, yeah. <laughs> I was still trying to fix it. Yeah. 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 I mean, like I said, it's me, the, uh, with, as with everything, there's happy mediums, but uh, you know, striving to, to always be better, I think, is a, is a common denominator with successful people. No, no two ways about it. Um, all right. So, childhood-wise, obviously, you grew up in South Africa. Can you kind of synopsize what what that was like? Because I know most of the people listening. I mean, we do have people in in South Africa and New Zealand, Australia, and Europe that, that listen to the show. But um, you know, most of the of the listener base is, is in in the states, and so I'd love to get kind of a a synopsis or a, or a um, a chronological version of, of uh, okay. What so was I like. was born 1971. So I grew up in the 70s, and at that time, um, apartheid was in effect in South Africa. So that was a defining thing for me, really, the framework of my existence. I guess I had parents who were both very, very uh, smart and interesting, and um, also encouraged us to always have an opinion. You know, so I think. A lot of the values that I have, some things were innate because I was born with, you know, a very, a very uh, soft heart and a big heart and um, and a curious mind. That's the sort of the nature. But in terms of the nurture, I was raised in a home where people were treated with respect, mm -hmm. and um, no quarter was given. You know what I mean? And also, where consistency was a, a significant value, you didn't. You know, you don't get to like be an asshole to people at work and then in your personal life, you live a different kind of life and then claim that you're this kind of person. I'm an honorable person. Oh, except at work, I'm not an honorable person. You know what I mean? Yeah. You got to be consistent. You've got to, if you, if you say you believe in something, you actually have to mean it. And if you mean it, then you have to know what you're prepared to do uh, to stand up for that. And, um... You know, we had a big family. I had, I had a really big family. It, it may sound idyllic. It wasn't. My parents got divorced when I was eight. And I uh, remember the weekend my dad moved out one, on Saturday or, or something, like the Saturday or Sunday. And the following weekend, he came to pick us up. And we went running down the stairs. My sister and I, all excited, jumped in the car. And there's this little girl sitting there. And I'm eight. My sister, I think, was like 12. And uh, there's this little five-year-old blonde girl. And my dad's like, hello, girls. Say hello to your sister, Leanne. Oh, shit. And we were like, hi. <laughs> and that was the end of the conversation, right? No explanation given. Jesus. <laughs> Here you go. So I had a crazy, wild, explosive, 
Sicilian upbringing because my family um, gatherings were always, sure, they very often went up in flames with somebody storing out, storming out, or more than one person. But um, but I'm so grateful to my parents for teaching us how to be decent people yeah. and how to treat people decently and also to know who we were. Mm. That's really, I think, probably the most important thing about my childhood. I always knew I was loved and I always knew who I was. Yeah. And that nobody can take those two things away from you, right? They can't yeah. take that from you. And I think that above everything else in my life is why I've been um, I've been able to do the things I've managed to do, how I ended up somewhere like 60 Minutes when I came from nowhere in Africa, you know? Yeah. Because I, I know who I am and, uh, and, I, and I, you don't, people, you know, when you're in Iraq or Afghanistan or Angola, Mozambique, Siberia, it really doesn't matter, even Europe, people know when you're faking mm -hmm. and they don't like it. And <clears throat> respect is really important. It's the basis, I think, of everything in mm -hmm. life. And when you fake respect, people know you're doing that too, you yeah. know? Yeah. So I'm not perfect. And even when I'm on television, to me, I'm not perfect. I don't look perfect. My hair is never perfect. I don't speak in perfect sound bites. But I am uh, I'm always who I am, mm -hmm. always. And uh, people like that real... They know, they know when something's not real, True. and it matters to all of us. Yeah. So uh, that my child, of, if anything, I mean, Africa is beautiful. South Africa is gorgeous. And I grew up outdoors. I was a dive master. I almost became an instructor, but then politics got the better of me when the <laughs> head of the South African Communist Party was assassinated, and the country went up like that, you know, and I was drawn deeper into journalism. But I worked from a young age. I worked from, I lied when I was... 14, I lied about my age and got a job scooping ice cream. Really? <laughs> yeah. I loved working. Yeah. I loved working. And then I also started working as a journalist when I was 17. So yeah. I did that early too. But um, South Africa is a place of uh, passion. African people are very passionate and alive. And yeah. place of the sun. I'm a child of the sun. I love the sun and the water. And, uh, and I love think people who are real. And yeah. that's... And then, of course, you know, I had the greatest possible um, introduction to journalism, too, because in South Africa, we were fighting, we were all fighting for something that we believed was very powerful and noble and worthy. Yeah. And that was for freedom and justice for all mm -hmm. and the end of apartheid and end of institutionalized racism in South Africa. And so um, that was... That was everything to me growing yeah. up. And I, you know, I worked constantly. I barely, I barely remembered a weekend from a holiday from a, yeah. you know, and anything else. Because work for me wasn't just work. It was about, it was about life. Yeah. Well, I mean, without a doubt, your parents did a, a, f a fantastic job in instilling both a, a genuine nature and, and, uh, and an authentic work ethic. I mean, you can see it in, in how you carry yourself and the job that you do, you know, as long as I've known you and even well before it and just following your work. But um, I'm curious, two things, I guess. Number one is that, is that in terms of the South African uh, society as a people, would you say that, that most households are more that way than they are here? And secondly, if, if you had to contrast what it, what it was like there compared to here, like what are some of the big differences Growing well, up there. So we only got television in like 1979. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So just think about that. And it would start at five in the afternoon yeah. and it would run for an hour or two hours. So mm -hmm. there's so many things here that um, it's, it's very difficult if you grow up with them to imagine what it's like being without them, True. right? What the similarities I think are that. South Africans, like Americans, are doers, right? It's a younger country, part of the new world, and people. Um, People are creative and innovative and, and they do stuff. The biggest difference, I would say, that of the most significant um, difference, because it affects so much, is that in the United States, you're at the center of the world and you know that you're at the center of the world and you're the world leader. And a lot, of, a lot revolves around you, international business, trade and you know, technology and uh, politics and... Uh, entertainment and fashion and money and all of that. The United States is right at the center of it all. And you never, 
you know, you never doubt your own significance. I grew up in a place where we never doubted our own insignificance yeah. because we're not at the center of anything. We're an afterthought. And, um, and, and I never minded that. I didn't grow up with a big chip on my shoulder. I just grew up with a yearning to go to the center mm. and, and learn about it, you know, and see what it was like. So that, that changes your perspective. I think when you, when you grow up far away and you realize, I mean, I, you know, no one cares what happens uh, ultimately in South Africa. We don't affect and change anything. It's part of the reason Mandela was so extraordinary because the way he fought and uh, what he did, he, uh, the whole world paid attention. Mm -hmm. And that is unbelievable. It doesn't take a lot in the United States to get people around the world to pay attention to what you're doing. But when you are, you know, in a place like South Africa, it does take a lot. So I would say that is very, very different. But what's also similar is... South Africa is a very physical culture too. You know, you're always outside. You're either, I was diving or I was swimming or I was, I grew up doing martial arts. And so I loved that because when I went to Europe, I went to live in Paris and work as an au pair, which is basically a glorified term for a domestic yeah. <laughs> servant. Yeah. Um, I realized that Europe is a lot about taking a slow walk along the Seine or sitting and having a cup of coffee and, you know, in those days, a cigarette yeah, and all yeah. of that. And I almost, you know, I always lost my mind doing that at age 17 and 18 because I wanted to go, go, go. And so I had to learn. I remember saying to myself, you know, there's no point in wasting all this time in living in Paris looking for what you know from South Africa. Mm -hmm. you got to look at what's right in front of you. You've got to find the value in that. And, I, and that actually was a lesson that was very useful because that's what I do in Afghanistan or Yemen or wherever it happens to be. Don't go there looking for what you know. Go there looking for what is there. Sure. You know? W would you say that, that that type of both outlook and your upbringing was more common in South Africa or would you say it was more of a, an anomaly having that kind of... So, you know, it's so easy to answer a question like that. Um, and act as if you know the answer and your answer is worth something. But really, we're just guessing, right? I mean, like, how the hell should I know? I would say that uh, because I don't know. I wasn't growing up in America at that time. I was growing up there. And I don't know what happened in every house mm -hmm. here or there. But if I had a sense of it, I would say, um, I would say this country is just so different, right? I mean, it's just every place Every state, there's, okay, you can get a bunch of states along the East Coast that are kind of similar, you know, from where well, you go from Massachusetts to New York to Washington, D.C., there's a lot that's similar. But look how different that is to somewhere like uh, Colorado, right? Or entirely different to a small town in Texas. Mm -hmm. So I think it's hard to give a, a, like a broad, uh, a broad general state definitive statement about that. I think you have both in, in the United States. You have people who are very motivated, who, uh, you know, who are unstoppable and who, uh, and who live like that. And then, and then you have people who um, are very inward looking and not looking out at the world and have a different kind of approach. But is it part of, is that sort of motivation um, part of American DNA? I think my experience is yes. What do yeah. you think? I, uh, yeah, I mean, I would agree with you in that it, it's it varies so much here. You yeah. know, I, I guess you know, for me, having never even been to South Africa, my my curiosity lies in: does it seem like that's more part of South African culture is being raised kind of with the same? Um, well, when, when no one when no one gives a shit about you, you got to make it happen. Yeah. You know, South Africans know they got to make it happen. Yeah. I mean, that's. That's sort of why the culture, how the country has survived. It's how, look at the Afrikaners, they're a white tribe, right? It's, they're the descendants of the Dutch colonizers, Dutch and German and French Huguenot colonizers in South Africa. They don't exist anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, people look at them because they're white and say, Africa's not your real home. But they literally don't, if Africa's not their home, South Africa, they don't have a home. Yeah. So that's a ridiculous thing to say. It may not have been their home when it was home to the Zulus and the Tswanas and the Peris and the Basutu and all the other tribes, but they were born, that soil gave birth to them. Yeah. They didn't exist outside of South Africa and they still don't mm -hmm. as a nation. So, um, so when, you, when that happens to you, you know, and it's part of your survival, 
I think it's sort of, it is in the DNA of every South African. Yeah. Is it in the DNA of every American? Hmm. Maybe not. No, I don't think so. You know, I mean, there's, to me, like, like I said, there's just too many, there, there's too much variance from state to state and, and uh, you know, just from a socioeconomic standpoint, you know, some people, there just doesn't need to be, you know, yeah. for some of the same reasons that you had mentioned earlier with it being kind of the center of so many things that I think there's a certain amount of arrogance and and complacency that comes with that where there's not that sense of urgency and and uh, need or desire to make shit happen the way that there is in a lot of other places. And I think you see that. I'm sure you've seen it in all the places you've been. I know I have in, in every other country I've been to. There There is more of a sense of, of urgency uh, in just in terms of life, you know, and survival and uh, and getting things done and, and, you know, having to look out for yourself because nobody else is type, type of thing. That, that, that well, again, think about it this way, Mike. If you're, you know, how many people have you met who have, who've been very, very successful and overcome <clears throat> a lot to achieve something? Their kids are growing up having so, all those things, yeah. right? And the kids are never the same. Yep. They're, they're, ne- yeah. they don't, they're not as hungry typically yeah. as their parents. I mean, they're very often, you know, uh, it's, yeah. it's, and it's hard to give your children a sense of that now when they've never been without food to give them a sense of what it's like yeah. to be hungry, yeah. right? You know, how do you do that? You, yeah, they have you to find out on their own. They have to, they have to have their you know, time in their life where they don't know where their next meal is coming from. Mm-hmm. And even then it's not the same because they're equipped with skills that they know this is temporary in some way, yeah. right? Yeah. This, is not, this is not it. They yeah. have... They have hope and a degree of certainty that they will move beyond this, yeah. which is very different from being someone who that's all they've ever known, mm-hmm. and they cannot even see a way past that because yeah. it probably is going to be all they ever know. Yeah, yeah. There's a, with you know even in those situations, there's a almost a subconscious safety net I think that exists that yeah that people are, are going to know that it's going to be okay. Type yeah, that's why I love to hear people say like, <clears throat> especially in a place like for example New York. Right, you got a lot of people who don't have a lot. Young people who are trying to make it, or all the rest of it, and uh, and think they know what it means to be poor. You don't know what it means to be poor until you've been working as many jobs as a human being can possibly work, and you're still living in poverty, mm-hmm. and you still can't provide for your children, and you still can't take care of yourself, and you still. And you know, without any doubt, that that is exactly how life is still going is going to be till the day you die. Yeah. that's a very different in- experience and understanding of poverty. Yeah, then a, you few, know? a few weeks of uh, having, or a even life, years, yeah. a few years of yeah. sharing an apartment in New York and yeah. not being able to go to the fanciest restaurants. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, absolutely. I think, uh, like, like I said, I love the, I love that perspective from uh, from an outsider's viewpoint in terms of, of being raised outside this country. It, uh, I think it's very valuable. Um, so, in terms of the the school experiences, the grade school, you know, elementary, junior high, high school, is that set up kind of the same? And, and is that in conjunction with the time that you grew up in South Africa? Kind of what what drove you and, and incentivized you to, to go into journalism? I went into journalism because I love to write. I'd always been a writer, <clears throat> sorry, and um, I was raised in a house of readers. You know, books were very, very important. Really, I guess a lot of life revolved around books. My father um, was subscribed to National Geographic, mm-hmm. so <clears throat> magazines, you know, of that nature. Yeah. We were not allowed to touch the National Geographic <laughs> magazines, which yeah. was super frustrating because you could use them yeah. for school projects. It's like uh, in, in America, Playboys, guy. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away from your dad's Playboy. Oh, it's exactly like that. No, Mike. <laughs> okay, so that's a, funny that yeah. you mentioned that because in South Africa, Playboy was like legendary, right? Yeah. Oh, my word. Would you believe that in America they have this magazine yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you can actually see naked women yeah. in it? And so we didn't have anything like that in South Africa yeah. when I was growing up I'm sure they have it now yeah. um, we had a very tame uh, version that was that once once I was fo- I was photographed for an article about diving scuba yeah. diving okay let's just be clear <laughs> I wasn't doing a nude or semi-nude photo shoot but anyway I ended up being in that magazine which was not uh, my finest moment but one that generated a lot of uh, yeah. not very good jokes from everyone who knew me for and still does yeah. actually yeah. but um Books were and and books and magazines and were a big part of that. And 
uh, you weren't allowed to deface a book. If you mm. wrote on it or didn't treat it or handle it properly, that got you into trouble in my house. Yeah. And so that was a big part of it. But I went to a school that was, uh, Winston Churchill was one of the board members at my oh, school. Wow. It was founded by British lords and aristocrats. Mm-hmm. And actually, the best thing about my school was that we had a crazy headmistress. And when I say crazy, I mean it in a good way because she, uh, during the uh, anti-apartheid years, allowed schoolgirls to skip lessons on a, on the, in the afternoons and go up to the university up the road and protest. Really? Yeah. Wow. So when, when these, and these protests and marches and rallies and that would very often end with in volleys of tear gas, right? right? So who would take that responsibility and liability on yeah. as a school principal? Oh, yeah. And anyone, you didn't have to, but <laughs> anyone who wanted to could. And so that, um, that to me is really what defines the most important things about my education. So that I was lucky enough to go to a place that, in fact, even before that, the single most important thing was when education in South Africa was still segregated and there were schools for black kids and white schools for white kids. My school, being a semi-private school that had government subsidies, but was but was also but was mostly private, took uh, the parents voted, and they voted to be um, to become multiracial, to have no, you know, no racist requirements for um, qualifications for the school, and so and we forewent government subsidies in order to do that. So it wasn't just a vote; it was actually. Um, it actually cost everybody financially, but it was that important to the people. And, and what I love about that is they're in apartheid South Africa, all white parents and all white kids and all white school. And they, uh, years, I mean, 10 years before segre- uh, rate education was um, opened up, you know, in South Africa, across the board in South Africa, my school did that. So I went to school with um, black kids and Indian kids and whatever else. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is, that I think is, it's consistent with how I was raised. Yeah. And it was, um, it was a big deal to all of us. You know, we loved that. I mean, can you imagine as a kid, if I was friends with a black kid in my class, we couldn't go to the movie theater together. Really? I mean, yeah. it was like, so back, we back, couldn't go to like the beach together. No shit. Yeah, I could if I wanted to go to, you know, beaches for black people, but that that would have been controversial and yeah. and risky and whatever else. So yeah, yeah think yeah. you know, that yeah. brings it home to you, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean like like it was in the, you know, 50s and 60s back here when it started to shift, but uh w- at what age did it did it uh, shift for for you when that vote took place? Well, the most uh, significant sort of events with the at, that sort of sig- symbolized the end of apartheid were when uh, Nelson Mandela was released from prison. That was just a big deal. And I remember as a young, oh, what was that? Yes, I would have been a schoolgirl. As a young schoolgirl, the leader of South Africa at the time, Peter Blue Boita, was going to do this famous, famous, famous speech. And everyone was anticipating that Nelson Mandela would be released because at that time he was you know, known all over the world and he'd been in prison 20 years or something like that. Um, and uh, San- South Africa had been subject to sanctions and was you know, the, feeling the pressure and all the rest of it. And um, I went as a young schoolgirl, maybe 14 or 15, 16 years old, to listen to this famous speech. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he did nothing <laughs> that everyone thought he was going to do. He did not unban the ANC. He did not <laughs> release Nelson Mandela. He dug in his heels and said, basically, you know, Tough screw shit. you to the world. Yeah. And it was called, he, his nickname was the O Crocodile, which in Afrikaans means the old crocodile. And it was called the Rubicon speech um, because he was expected to cross the Rubicon, you know, and he did Maybe. not. Yeah. And uh, it was such a major, it was such a disappointment. So when I finished high school, I went and uh, lived and worked in Paris. And when I came back from Paris, that was when, in fact, I came back for this because I didn't want to miss it. I came back, I, I was living in New York after Paris and I came back from New York because we knew that um, the prime minister at the time, F.W. de Klerk, who pushed his predecessor out of office, um, was going to unban the ANC first and then release Nelson Mandela. And that was February 1990. Yeah. And that was still one of the greatest days of my life when the ANC was unbanded. If you can think of a Super Bowl party, imagine the entire country having yeah. a Super Bowl party. I mean, 
everywhere you went, people were honking their horns, people were cheering out the windows. It was just, I know there were pockets of South Africa, you know, that may not have felt that way, but they, I can tell you now, they were few and, uh, and you didn't feel them. It was, it was just, it was a celebration um, in the streets that went on for some time, actually. Yeah. That really was, it was the beginning for all of us who had fought so long and hard and waited for that day. And I thought, okay, now's the day we all, this is life. It yeah. meant life for all of us, yeah. black and white. So it sounds like that was kind of the defining moment for the whole for the whole country then as far as that goes. Without huh? question. Yeah. That's why de Klerk shared the Nobel Peace Prize with yeah. Mandela. Yeah. Because people recognized that Mandela couldn't have done it on his own. It took a visionary like de Klerk who said, I don't want to inherit um, ashes. Mm -hmm. And it took exactly the same quality in Nelson Mandela because he could have burned that country to the ground. Yeah. You know, I mean, literally, if his name was on the ballot paper, people would <clears throat> still vote him into office even though he's dead. Like, yeah. that's the power that man yeah. had and has yeah. still, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And he, but he chose to use it uh, in a much more, much more difficult way, right? He yeah. didn't do what most people would have done. Instead, he convinced black South Africans that, um, that, being together and building that country together was better than revenge. Yeah, no, it's, I mean to me, it's it's hard. It's it's a great story to to hear, and it's also hard for for both me and I know most people listening that are from here to even be able to wrap their mind around what that that must have been like. But uh, that's that's incredible. Um, so obviously, that had a huge impact in terms of you yeah. getting into journalism. Can you walk us through kind of the you graduate high school and then uh, now get So into before I graduated high school, um, a woman came to speak to us about extra parliamentary political activity for women, which basically means outside of parliament and official government space, um, what could what women were doing in South Africa to fight apartheid. And there was a woman called Helen Joseph who had an organization called the Black Sash. And these women would wear black sash around their waist. And they would walk into protests and they would uh, shield, you know, hold hands and shield um, people who were demonstrating from the police. And they did unbelievable work. And they were like, to me, as a young girl, seeing what they did, they were like angels. And Helen Joseph was the leader of that organization. And um, I went to speak to the journalist who came and talked to us about their work at school. And I said, you know, I think I want to be a journalist. And I think this is what I've always wanted. And she said, well, you know, uh, come, and, uh, come and see me at the paper where I work. And I'll, I'll, uh, see, I'll talk to my boss and I'll see if we can, you know, get you to help out at the paper. And I thought that was, you know, unbelievable. And I had, when I was eight, my English teacher asked me if my mother was picking me up from school that day. And I said, yes. And she said, well, don't leave the classroom. I want to go with you. I need to talk to your mother. I said, okay. And when my mother pulled up, Mrs. Anderson, her name was, she said to my mother, I just want to tell you that if this child doesn't become a writer, it will be a crime because she's really, really good. And uh, it, so it was always in my head, you know, that I would write. It was what I loved. Even at eight. At eight, yeah. yeah. And um, although it's probably half the people I've worked with at 60 Minutes are saying, oh, God, she's really not that good. You know, there's much better writers than her. Um, it doesn't mean that. It just, it was, so it was something that I, that, um, I was drawn to from very young. And then, um, so when I went to, into journalism, I went to a, a newspaper. You know, I wanted to write. I wasn't thinking about television, to be honest with you, and I, or and I wasn't thinking about radio. It was the writing part of it. But I also knew that you have to, that the best writing comes from things you know about, right? Mm -hmm. Not the things you're making up. Yeah. So um, I, I knew I wanted to get out and see it for myself. I can't, I can't explain it to you. I can't. Isn't there wasn't. Um, a moment of clarity or a discovery. It was just absolutely 100%. I always knew that. Yeah. So, um, so I went to speak to the newspaper editor about working there in the school holidays. And I remember he had William Sanderson and me had a cigarette dangling out one side of his mouth and every other word was fuck, 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 fuck. And I always had a cup of coffee somewhere, you know, and uh, the newsroom was just a haze of smoke, cigarette smoke in those days. And from my first day, 
they expected me to report and write, and that's what I did. In fact, I wrote my first story on the back of a Peter Stuyvesant cigarette box with the butt <laughs> of a pencil that some grumpy photographer fished out the bottom of his camera bag, yeah. and uh, I never looked back. Yeah. So what? So from from that all the way up to sixty minutes. I mean, has has that road been? <laughs> you know, just, I mean, is it one crazy story after the next? I mean, because one of the, I think, you know, expectations, at least myself, and I know a lot of us have uh, listening that don't know jack shit about journalism, um, is that is that there's that paying of dues and, and you know, you go from here yeah. to the next step to the next step. Yeah. And, and it's just, uh, you know, is that what, what that experience was like for you? Or can you can you walk us through how that went? So, you know, I say the two most important things for me is people often come to me and say, you know, I want to, you know, do what you do, translate. I want your job. Yeah, but I want it right now. <laughs> yeah, I, but I, I want it same, right now. Same shit, but How do I do that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, it was a little different for me because I, um, I, I wasn't born and raised here and I didn't grow up. The system here is you start local, right? You go to a local paper or a local station or whatever and you work your way up. And if you're lucky, you get your big break and you go national. Um, South Africa is different because I, I grew up in one of the biggest news stories in the world, and there were a lot of foreign journalists, and that's how I made contacts and connections. Um, so I sort of, I came at it in a, I didn't work my way up in the States, but I did do every job known to man. And I would, you know, do the lowliest job and uh, whatever job. And I still today would do the lowliest job, to be honest with you. I don't, you know, I don't mind carrying boxes and making coffee and driving and doing whatever. But um, we didn't have union rules, which made things a little more, you know, uh, flexible. Mm -hmm. So it's in the U.S., I can't believe still sometimes we'd have to get someone to press the button on the machine and ask the editor if that was okay, if we did that, yeah. you know, after they've gone home to sleep because we're still working through the night. Yeah. South Africa, that kind of stuff didn't, you know, exist. So I did every job known to man. And, um, and I would frequently do two, three other people's jobs as well just because um, I wanted to learn as much as I could. And uh, if, it's like if the guys at the weekend, when I was working weekends, if the guys had kids or wanted to go party or do whatever, I was like, Oh, don't worry. You know, I'll I'll cut the story, yeah. right? And I'll uh, write the story, and I'll uh, satellite the story. You can go home, you know, because um, I was young and I wanted to do it all. I did all the administration and paperwork and client services and everything for my boss with his name on the paper, yeah. you know, because I didn't do it for credit. I did it to learn, True. and I didn't and I and they didn't want to do it, and I didn't care. Um, so what I did is I started at a newspaper. When I was 17 years old, I got my first job at a Sunday newspaper. And at one of the press conferences I was covering, uh, I was talking to a journalist from the Times, Gavin Bell, from the Times of London. And he said, you know, the best news experience you can get for hard news is at a news agency. So that's where you want to go, somewhere like Reuters or AP. But he said, don't stay too long. Yeah. That was his advice. Yeah. He said, those agencies are full of two kinds of people. People who are there learning, you know, how to do hard news and do it better than anyone else. And those who stayed too long. Yeah. And they're bitter and they're really <laughs> grumpy and unhappy. He said, don't stay too long. Yeah. Well, I loved, I loved agency news, right? I mean, I loved the news agency because every deadline is right now. Yeah. And I, uh, I loved working to those deadlines and beating everybody else. I am a little competitive. Yeah. And, but also I loved the immerse, you just immerse yourself in it and you know your story. You're like a beat reporter for a hundred different beats. Mm -hmm. And that um, I, I'm always better when I know, when I'm coming from a position of knowledge, right? I don't, I'm not good at faking it. It makes me uncomfortable. So at CNN, when I'm thrown on air and I had to be an expert about things I wasn't an expert on, and I had to sort of pretend, yeah, no, I sucked. So uh, that wasn't my strength. So then I, um, when I went to college, straight up, uh, after high school, I went and lived in France and worked and lived in New York and worked doing, seeing the world. When I came back, I did my degree. And all through my degree, I worked at a daily newspaper. And actually, I would say nobody ever, I never applied for a job. I just always went there and forced the editor or whoever it was to see me yeah. and, uh, and then offered to work for free. Yeah. 
Yeah. I said, when I was in college, I said, you've got nobody my age on your stuff. You need a younger audience. Don't you need young readers? Yeah. Let me work for you. Yeah. And that's what I did. And people would pay me for what they used or pay me whatever they wanted. I never cared about money. I just didn't care about, I didn't care about anything. I just wanted to do the job and do the work. So, and the other thing is I never, I never went into television because I wanted to be on TV and be famous. I went into television because TV takes an army. You know, you need a sound man and a producer and uh, field producers and runners and this and that. So in, when I uh, went to the New York Times and other newspapers in South Africa, they've got their journalists, right? And then they've got mostly black people helping them navigate the townships and, you know, the black suburbs and neighborhoods and that, which was really where the story was happening most of the time. So they didn't need a little white girl working for them, right? And they had no interest in hiring me. So I ended up in television because um, Mike Cadman at CBS News gave me the, uh, told me uh, to try Viz News, a news agency, because they've hired lots of freelancers. And again, I just talked the guys there into letting me work. In fact, when I was sitting there, the cameraman who was the bureau chief was trying to write a story and watching him type was just agony. And I said to him, hey, would you like me to do that for you? You know, because yeah. this story was breaking while I was there. And he said, sure. And honestly, that's the same thing I did at CNN in Atlanta, I don't know, 15 years later, when I went to go and see the news editor there. I did something for them. They said, thank you. And I said, thank me in person. Yeah. You know, let me come and see you. And I flew myself out to Atlanta. And... Uh, when the phones were ringing, I just started answering the phones because people were busy, right? Yeah. When uh, first job I ever had for British television, a friend of mine in Jerusalem called me and said, hey, I heard that ITV is looking for a correspondent in Israel to cover the second intifada. You know, maybe you could do that. So I called them. I was living in London at the time. And I said, oh, you know, I'm in London on vacation, but I live in Jerusalem. And I heard that you were looking for someone there. <laughs> and I slept on my friend's sofa for the next few months. They, yeah. they hired me for a few months. So, you know, people think I never went, nobody ever just gave me a job, you know, or gave me my big break or anything like that. Um, even today, it's still got to come from me. You sure. know, if you expect it all to happen, if you think, oh, I've graduated college now, now somebody owes me a job, yeah. somebody owes me an opportunity, somebody owes me a something. My mother um, and father raised us you know, to understand that nobody owes you anything and the yeah. world doesn't owe you a living, yeah. right? You get out what you put in. True. And I, uh, so I made all those things happen along the way. And sure, sometimes I got lucky, mm -hmm. but they, you know, Richard Butler, one of the guys I work with always says, I, <laughs> I find, I say to him, it's better, you know, we, we make, we try to make smart decisions, but sometimes we just need to be lucky. And he said, you know what? I find the smarter I am, the luckier I get. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's a no-shitter. So, I mean, for me, uh, one of the things I'm curious about is is where all have you lived in different uh, organizations have you worked for? I mean, is the, does that take you 20 minutes to outline that? Or No, I'll give you the quick version is after I worked in all these newspapers and then got into television by going to Reuters News Agency, which was Viz News, I, was, I loved that. Um, but I realized I was working for a man who uh, basically had... <clears throat> maxed out, let's just say. And uh, he was not very good. And I'd reached that point where I needed to leave the news agency or I was going to be one of those bitter people. Yeah. And it was hard. It was like severing a limb because it had been my life and soul. And I learned so much there and we shared so much. And there's a real brotherhood, right? When you're in the trenches like that with all the other people you work with. And we believed in it so passionately. But my boss said, uh, treated me as very badly the one day. And I, I looked at him and I said, you know what, fuck you and fuck you and fuck you. And I slammed the newsroom door as hard as I could and I was disappointed the glass didn't break. <laughs> <laughs> then I went into the next room office and called my mother and cried. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then I got on a plane yeah. and I persuaded uh, the American networks in London to let, hire me freelance. And I, uh, I, I did like a couple of meetings Flew back to South Africa, packed up my life, and went back to London. And, and I worked in the beginning freelance at uh, ABC and CBS. Mm -hmm. No, CBS and NBC. And then I was hired to work on the CBS, uh, the ABC news desk. 
I did that for like a year. That was torture. I used about one one millionth of my skills and abilities, but I wasn't going to walk away. I wanted to show people when they looked at my resume to know that I was committed, you know, that I'm, that I'm not someone who just like flits in and out. So even it was really hard and really boring and there were a lot of horrible people uh, making your life hell. I stuck it out for a year. Then I went and uh, ran around Siberia and a bunch of places like that doing a TV show for some production company um, that was a joint production for Sky News and uh, and Fox News yeah, Entertainment. Some crazy shit. Fucking Siberia. That was fantastic. <laughs> no shit. Six weeks living with the Chukchi in Siberia. Yeah, and funny. I think that was like 1996. Oh, my word. Yeah, going whale hunting and doing all kinds of stuff. So I loved Siberia. And I loved, and I was, when I got to Russia, I was like, oh, I like these people. Yeah. These people, they're white Africans. These are my people. Yeah, like, they're it. like Africans, yeah. but they all happen to be white. Yeah. I was like, in a way, I'm home here because this kind of craziness is very familiar. <laughs> yeah. I get it. You know, the British are very, yeah. you know, sort of passive aggressive and polite. Yeah. And Americans are... Uh, Obnoxious? No. <laughs> you know, Americans can be obnoxious, but I don't buy into it. Gosh. I don't buy completely into all of those, like, yeah. you know, cliches and stereotypes. Right. So then after that, uh, I was, I really wanted to work at CNN and I wrote to them sort of every month for like two years. And um, I ended up freelancing for the European Broadcasting Union and getting a shot at CNN. Then I realized very quickly that it wasn't the place for me. And I took a job with an international aid agency. Um, Because I was on the Albanian border during the refugee crisis, during the Kosovo war. And I worked for that agency, um, the International Medical Corps, doing humanitarian work for a year. And that was the only time in my life that I ever confronted the question of whether I really wanted to be a journalist. Up till that point, every step I took was a step towards being a better journalist and doing the work I wanted to do as a journalist. And I wrote for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, one of the things I'm most proud of in my career. Love that newspaper. Love that newspaper. Love the way they they are. Love the professionalism and the ethic there. And when I was an aid worker, I would write for the journal. Um, Like we were you know, doing medical work in mental institutions in, in Kosovo. And I would write about that for the paper. I never knew what I got paid. I got paid almost nothing. But, and, you know, sometimes I would phone news organizations and just offer to file for them and never get paid. I filed for the South African Broadcasting Corporation, SABC. I never, ever worked for them. They never paid for me. I, I filed for them whenever someone said yes on the end of the phone. Yeah. <laughs> and then... Uh, then I decided, okay, aid work, very noble, not for me. Yeah. So I, I need to go back to being a full-time journalist. And I applied for the only job I've ever applied for with a job application, which is at British Television, GMTV in London. And at my interview, they asked me uh, if I could name any of the anchors. <laughs> <laughs> and... No, what is the answer to that? I'm ashamed to say. I couldn't, except there was only one person I knew there, and we talked about him a lot. But they were like, okay, besides Martin Frizzell, this guy, who else can you talk about? And I couldn't name anyone. And then they said, okay, what about correspondents, not just the anchors? <laughs> couldn't name anybody. I walked out of that. Wow, I phoned my husband at the time, and I said, you know what? I'm not going to get that job, and I don't deserve it because yeah. I did no preparation. And who the hell do I think I am rocking up for a job interview? without knowing the first thing about that place and what, and you know, I knew them because when I worked at Reuters, they were a client. So I knew them from that point of view, but I just knew they did the news and I know what the news is. I know what journalism is. So that's what I figured was the only qualification I needed. (laughs) I got that job. Oh shit. As it turns out. Did you ever ask them what? what, No, 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 it was too embarrassing. I never (laughs) wanted to go back there. But what that did for me is they didn't have anybody like me, yeah. but they recognized the value they lo- of journalism. They want, <clears throat> hired me for that. So they let me just do that all over the world. And I did the floods in Mozambique. And that's why when 9-11 happened, that's where I was working. Mm. And I said, let me go to Afghanistan. And they were like, no, it's too dangerous. And I'm like, let me go, let me go. And what I did is I started working on how to get into Afghanistan because I knew, I knew I was going to do it ultimately. I, we, you know, I was one of many journalists who knew instantly that 
on 9-11 that it was Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. We knew he was in Afghanistan, and I knew that was where the story was going. You didn't have to be a rocket scientist to figure it out. And um, I ended up going for GMTV to Afghanistan and living on the front line with Afghan soldiers and reporting on that war, the lead of every broadcast they had every day for three and a half months on my own. And after that, the BBC, 60 Minutes, NBC, everybody, I could have had any job I wanted anywhere, anywhere. Yeah. And I chose 60 Minutes. Yeah. That's how I went there. Yeah. So that three and a half month period, uh, I mean, was that just the fucking Wild West? I mean, because I know when we first met, I mean, just some of the very casual stories that I, I remember <laughs> hearing, you know, usually around a, a table with a few drinks involved with, you know, a, a bunch of former teammates and whatever involved. But um, just some of the shit that you've been through there, I was just like, you know, whether it's writing a book or just telling stories, like you have more of them than most guys I know that, that have spent a fuck ton of time there. You know, like what... And to me, like what I what I really want to expose the the listener to is is some of those that that I that I found my jaw fucking wide open here and like you you went through all of that like I mean whether it's smuggling yourself in via taxi cab to you know through uh, in Iraq or just just all that stuff like I would love to to get uh, you know some of some of that uh, insight as to what those what those three and a half months were like and then subsequently after that the time that you spent over there because you've arguably spent more time than probably anybody I know in those regions, you know, I mean, which is saying a lot. Well, you know, um, wow. It just, those three and a half months in Afghanistan were very hard, but they were also like the, some of the best time I've ever had on earth in my life, mm -hmm. you know, because this was it. This was where I was doing everything I ever wanted to do. Um, and doing it at the at the moment when it mattered. Sure. And um, I remember my my sister told me that my mother said to when after one of my calls from Afghanistan on that trip, you know, I don't understand what I did wrong and why she's so, you know, messed up that she feels like she has to go to such a terrible place and expose herself to such terrible risk. My sister said, what are you talking about? Did you hear her voice? Like, she's happier than she's ever been. Mm -hmm. And it's not because I'm messed up or anything like that. In fact, it's a profoundly sane, um, grounded decision for me. Um, because it's in those moments where no one's asking what your hair looks like or questioning what you're wearing on television, right? Mm -hmm. They're just so happy to hear that you're still alive and you and you know get hear your voice on the other end of the phone that you can file it's absolute freedom in your work because yeah. you can file the stories exactly as you find them and yeah. and and no one you know in new york um what is going to mess with you because yeah. they're just happy you're still alive yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that you've actually managed to meet your deadline yeah, sure. which is you know the other challenge yeah. so to get into afghanistan was very hard because the Taliban had 95% of the country under their control, firm control, right? And we forget very quickly, but that was when they were hanging women and executing women in the soccer stadium, right? In mm -hmm. front of everyone, um, just for wearing shoes with a buckle that was too shiny when the sun caught it, mm -hmm. or a sliver of flesh showing underneath their burqa. You know, that was... Um, it was very frightening, and the Taliban were this big evil that was very intimidating. And um, it w the Afghan government in exile, which was really the political representatives of the um, of the you know Northern Alliance, as they were called, they um, were a force that you still had to deal with. So I realized I had to get from London. I had to get to Germany, where they were based, to get a visa from them, so that you at least had a piece of paperwork that could in some way, maybe cover your butt if you needed it, right? Or at least without that piece of paper, I was, I was screwed whether I was in Taliban territory or their territory. So I had to get to Germany and get that. I had to get um, into Moscow because the best way into Afghanistan then was from the north, or whether it's one of those northern states, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, right? So I had to get, and you couldn't get to those places without going through Russia. And... Um, and I had to do it fast because 9-11 had just happened. And I spent the first couple days uh, and one night in a prison 
on the French-English border following Afghan refugees um, before my before my bosses would finally agree. I wore them down, and they agreed to let me go out there. So first to Germany, get that visa, then come back. Persuaded a guy in the Russian embassy in London to meet me at a cafe and give me my visa over coffee because he said it would be weeks. I said, no, brother, I need this in like hours, okay? Flying to Moscow tonight. Um, got to Moscow at four in the morning. I realized when I said to my cameraman, uh, Martin, do you have the carnet? And that's a piece of paper. If you've done ever worked in Africa, you know you ain't getting a single thing across the border without that piece of equipment. And I knew that Russia was a Kanye country. Mm -hmm. And he said, the what? And I was like, Fuck. okay, <laughs> I know how this is going. Yeah. So I, uh, I rearranged my underwear over the video phone and the other equipment that we needed, like the little, the satellite phone. Yeah. And I suggested to Martin that we go through customs separately. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hid the stuff, the basic survival equipment that I would need to survive and deliver, yeah. you know, still be on television. I took, and I let him take all the other equipment, and yes, lo and behold, everything was impounded. He came through <laughs> customs with the shirt on his back, and I sailed through with everything I had. And by the time we got to the hotel, now we haven't slept for like three days, right? Um, he found out that he had, his father had had a heart attack. And my boss phoned me and said, okay, Martin's going back. He's got to turn around and come back to Scotland, where his dad lived. He said, do you want to wait for a replacement, or are you going ahead? I said, uh, I'm, you're out of your mind. I'm not waiting, right? There's no way I'm waiting. And I had to get from Moscow to Tajikistan. For some reason, there were a gazillion people trying to do that, along with 2,000 journalists, and nobody could get on a flight. So I went to Tajik Airlines, and I persuaded the woman, the secretary, to let me go into the head of the airline's office. And I uh, just, I don't even really know what I said, but I ended up hiring his nephew as my translator yeah. and uh, <clears throat> bumping someone off a flight and flying a few hours later to Tajikistan where his nephew was standing on the runway with a pair, with a bunch of very pathetic looking little flowers for me <laughs> and going to a press conference the next day with the Afghan minister, uh, foreign minister in exile, and one of the journalists saying that his, his network was the only one not represented in my, it's not represented in your country, sir. And uh, can you help me with that? And Dr. Abdullah said, oh, yes. And, then he, and I said, and my network, which was my morning TV show, right? Yeah. Not, so Dr. Abdullah was flying into Afghanistan the next day, and he agreed to let us go with him. And we, all, we met... It was a team from CBS, and there was this guy from British TV, and there was me, and Matthew Chance from CNN. And uh, this helicopter was a mess. It was one of those old Russian makes, and had crashed several times and literally been soldered together. It still had some holes in it and some cracks, more than a few, and it was totally overloaded, so it couldn't take off. It kept, <laughs> kept getting like this high off the ground and then crashing back down. So every time I did that, we threw equipment off, and of course... I was, I was alone, right? Everyone else had a team of people, so my equipment was the first to go off. So when they threw my video phone off, I said, motherfucker, okay, if you throw that off, that's fine, but then you're doing my live shots, because yeah. without that, I couldn't you know, be on television. And this British uh, guy agreed, okay, fine. He had an Irish cameraman, Sean Swan, one of the best conflict cameramen, one of the best cameramen, best guys ever in the world. And Sean um, said, okay, if you do that, so you gotta keep your word. He said yes, having no intention of keeping his word, but Sean held him to that promise. And eventually we got off, there was nothing in the helicopter and just a wooden chair for Dr. Abdullah, the foreign minister, with a red cushion on it. And we all sat at his feet <laughs> of the Algia. And every time the helicopter lurched, you know, he would, the chair would fall over and he would fall on top of us. <laughs> we would put him back in the middle. And he was going to Hajjabauddin, which was just across the Afghan-Tajik border. And, of course, everyone wanted to go further. So they're like, Lara, you ask him. Lara, you ask him why? Because I'm the only girl in the helicopter, right? And uh, he said, sure. I said, Dr. Abdullah, please, we're so grateful that you've, you know, brought us here. Because you don't know, at this time, journalists are, like, going on horseback across the Hindu Kush, right? People are taking, I mean, I, it took me only days what 
some journalists still spent you know weeks and some of them even months trying to do. Yeah. And um, I said, we really need to go as close to the front as we can. He said, sure, no problem. So he spoke to the pilots, and then Hajib Baudin, he hops off the helicopter, and we've now got two Afghan pilots who speak no English, and they just keep flying. We have no idea where we're going. Absolutely no idea. And it got darker and darker and darker until it was totally pitch black. And I tell you, I never forget those pilots flying just seamlessly yeah. in total darkness through the mountains and the mountain passes. And they la we landed at the side of a river and there was a noose hanging from this bridge. And I thought, oh, well, if it goes wrong, I know where they're going to hang my body. <laughs> and the bunch of Afghan men who took all of our stuff. And I spent my first night in the country with about 40 or 50 Afghan men sleeping on the floor with them in this little house. Jesus. And uh, then, then persuaded them to get me down to the front line and then ended up living with the Afghan soldiers because I wanted to be, I, wanted, I didn't want to be miles away when the bombings were happening. Mm -hmm. right? And then I, I'd lived with them for so long at that point that when they did take Kabul, you know, they, um, they took me with them. Yeah. And then once the city had fallen, you know, it was, in fact, I went back many times with those soldiers who then became, uh, the commander became the police chief in Kabul. And so for, for this whole time, I mean, when you're embedded with them, what was that like in terms of how they treated you? I mean, with, was it, I mean, did they, did they respect you? Did they not respect you? Was there some hairy, hairy times where? Well, here I am, I'm like a 20 something year old woman on my own, right? In a country where the Taliban had been in control for like eight years and women did not appear in public ever without being in a burqa. And most of them, I'd say 90, 90 percent of the time, ninety eight percent of the women stayed behind mm -hmm. um, the walls of their home or compound. Yeah. You know, you just didn't see any women. It was very, very dangerous, and it was very scary. And the Taliban um, tortured. They lived, you know, through a reign of fear, and they tortured women, right, psychologically and and physically. And um, and there was. I mean, there was no quarter given, right? I mean, it was instant justice. I mean, the, the vice and virtue police, the policing every, uh, every inch of territory that they owned. So um, for me, it was, this, it was really odd. I've, the commander there had been trained by the Russians, and he's, he was a little westernized, and he spoke no English. Hello, please, thank you. In fact, I spent months teaching him how to say... I want peace and stability <laughs> in my country. That was what he used to say. That was his one sentence. And he actually did used to say it to yeah. the journalists who came there. Yeah. But he wanted, he didn't want me to wear a burqa or, you know, a headscarf or anything because he wanted to show that he was Western and he had a little girls' school there. And he assigned one of his personal bodyguards to be my bodyguard who spoke no English whatsoever. And that was, um, you know, it was... I didn't know which way it was going to go. I just had to go with my gut that this guy had was had more to gain keeping me intact yeah. than not. But the first night I slept um, in this little mud uh, place on the front line, and this, his soldiers woke me up in the middle of the night, you know, put with their hand over my face, like a, a stinky, dirty hand, by the way, and uh, like they're this far from your face, and they're all, you know, they all got their weapons and all that, and they're like come because no one speaks English and I'm like oh shit is this like a late night booty call for the general <laughs> right like I'm, I mean like how screwed am I right now yeah. and I'm you know you're walking along there to his uh to his mud shitty little mud <laughs> compound <laughs> you're like what is what you know you don't know yeah. so you're hoping for the best and trying to prepare yourself for the worst um and actually what we did for the next three months was just get rat face drunk every night <laughs> oh, shit. Um, with, by the way, at a certain point with a lot of Taliban yeah. commanders oh, who would shit. drive their cars up from Kabul at night or come area. across the front line to negotiate. Yeah. And, and they, they would get drunk? Absolutely shit face. <laughs> yeah. Fucking irony with that. Yeah. No, it was like, it was like crazy. And also they only had like teacups, right? Yeah. So they, and they always wanted me to drink first and I was not a drinker. Yeah. So, uh, no one would drink until I drank first. So I would 
sneak my cup like this and my bodyguard <laughs> would drink most of it for me. But it didn't take a lot to get me yeah. really, 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 really drunk. Yeah. So, um, and then they would try to persuade me to go back to Kabul with the Taliban guys. Yeah. And every, every time, you know, and I was like, no, 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 no. Like, that's not necessary. <laughs> I'm good here. Yeah. So um, living with the soldiers... I built relationships, which really count in Afghanistan. And the day, you know, I, I saw a lot of stuff that I've never spoken about and, I, and a lot of stuff that I didn't report on because my agreement with the commanding uh, officer there was, the Afghan, was that I wouldn't tell anyone that I knew that the Americans were conducting airstrikes and operating from Afghan soil because officially we weren't there yet. Yeah. And um, the, the, the day of... Actually, I would go down to the front line. I was... I was running through fields of mines, Mike. I had no idea. But my bodyguard, his older brother, was one of the top, uh, one of the top fighters and command is the most experienced guys there. And so he was really leading those positions um, on the airfield. And we would go down to him at night, his little brother and I, and he would show me the rockets and the mortars and say, like, which one tonight? You know, and then we would, they would shell the Taliban. <laughs> they would shell us back and then they would yeah. shell. And all he wanted was a bottle of whiskey. That's what he dreamed about. <laughs> Khoni, Commander Khoni, he just was killed, actually, really? in an ambush with um, all of his bodyguards. There were 17 of them. They just laid waste to his entire... Just here recently. Just like uh, a month and a half ago. Oh, shit. Yeah. Um, so Khoni <laughs> had fought in every war. And you know, I know what's so fascinating about that? That... Um, the day of the advance, when they actually did move on Kabul, um, Khawni had made, and uh, the general devised this plan. They'd made deals with the local Afghan Taliban, who, and, and Khawni had all these little units, and he sent his guys in, the Afghan Taliban, let them slip in quietly, and they attacked from uh, their own side. They attacked the... Al Qaeda guys, mm. so all the uh, the Pakistanis and the Arabs and all of them, and as they tried to flee, um, the Afghan Taliban, who they were fighting alongside, mowed them down, Jesus. and then Khoni's guys skinned the bodies. The Afghan Taliban and and Khoni and these guys, they all skinned the bodies. I went into the trenches and saw the skinned bodies. That's how I know. I saw it with my own eyes, but actually. During the, when they did that very quiet deception, which was what was the beginning of the, the um, move on Kabul, I wasn't allowed to be with Khoni. And so his brother and I listened to it on the radio. And at one point, they had 12 uh, Taliban prisoners. How do I know? Because Inayat held up the number of fingers, you know. And you could hear them. I could hear Khoni, like, yelling at these guys and talking to them and asking questions. And then I heard one guy spit. And um, this prisoner spit in Khoni's face. And I said to Inayat, like, what's happening? You know, and he showed me, like, in the face, you know. And then I heard 12 shots. <laughs> and, and, you know, it was like, okay, no more prisoners, you know. So uh, that was uh, really fascinating for me. But when, when um, we were allowed to move, when they started to advance on Kabul, and the general let me go in there, um, some of the soldiers wanted a picture taken with me. And, um, and some guy came out of the crowd and grabbed my breasts in front of everybody as we're standing, having our picture taken, me and like five Afghans, you know. And there's hundreds and hundreds of soldiers around us in the advance. And the general uh, stopped everything. Because I, I didn't think about it. It was just, I did what I would have done in a bar in, you know, New York. Yeah. And I, uh, I tried to hit this guy as hard as I could but he was he just did a drive-by yeah. so all I got was the back of his head as he started to disappear <clears throat> into the crowd and I remember his head you know I just connecting with the back of his head but unfortunately not hard not properly and this guttural scream came from my belly like I was just angry it was a real rage and you know in Afghanistan that was an absolute humiliation to be to be humiliated like that in front of everybody was a big thing and um, a stain on my honor. And it also put me in a very, very bad position. But I didn't think about all of that at the time. I just was so angry to be uh, treated that way. And the guys who knew me so well, you know, because they'd been around me for three, and a, three months at that point, were very upset for me. I was like a sister to them. And... Uh, 
And I just, and I was like, that motherfucker, like, where the fuck is he? This is, I am not putting up with this. And I like, I lost it. So they ran to get the general and um, uh, Baba, Baba John, and he stopped everything. And he sent parties of them out, pickup trucks. The guys went out to find this guy who had at this point run away. And they found him and dragged him back to my feet. I stayed with uh, Baba John, the commander, after that, because I didn't, you know, I was feeling a little exposed and vulnerable. And uh, he pulled his pistol out and put it to this guy's head and was like, yes, no. Jesus, giving you <laughs> I the... I was like, fuck, <laughs> shit. I mean, I'm pissed, but God, I don't want this man to be, you know, hurt, I like to die. But now what do I do? Because in that culture, you've got to be very careful as a woman, because I would have been a military mattress in four and a half seconds, yeah. you know, and uh, never seen the light of day. So I took the general aside because I spent many, many hours with him every night and day. And I said, look, it's just like my heart, you know, I can't do this. And even with very little English, he understood. And he said, don't worry, I beat him. <laughs> <laughs> and they took him away and put him in prison for a while. And I, I know he, he got a couple of beatings, I heard. But he did, he, they did release him. Yeah, Jesus. Well, so... Like this whole time that you're rolling around, one you're, you're dressed in jeans and a t-shirt and a t-shirt the whole fucking time. Yeah. What, how are you operating? Like, what are you operating on? For, one pair of jeans, by the way, and like three t-shirts yeah. for like three and a half months. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, are, do you have money? Are you using cash? Like, how are you surviving? Like, I'm. Uh, well, I'm. I. I borrowed a lot of money from Steve Harrigan from Fox yeah. News. <laughs> <laughs> it was one day on the front line where Steve came past where I was. Uh, because I was on my own, and he said, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay. And he said, so he said, I just realized last night that you've got my, uh, you've got my satellite phone, you've got my cameraman, because his cameraman, when he, was, when he could, would do my live shots for me, so I didn't have to do them myself. Yeah. Uh, you have half of my money, <clears throat> he said, and I don't help people. <laughs> he said, I'm not a helper. I don't help people. I don't even like people. How did this happen? I was like, Steve, I've got my life shot. Can I come talk to you about this afterwards? <laughs> so, you know, I just uh, finagled uh, a lot of things. And I didn't have a lot to give back. But like with the soldiers, I would, I would give them aspirin or eye drops or tea or, you know, the, the special Afghan special uh, troops their special forces who cleared the battlefield of all the mines. They came and slept in my little mud place, and I, um, and I made gave them bread and tea, and I talked all. I stayed up all night talking to these guys, and yeah. you know, I, I always gave a lot of myself, yeah. even when I didn't have a lot of things to give, yeah. and I always gave respect and yeah. time, and uh, it counted for a lot because nobody had a lot, and yeah. it always does, yeah. you know. So uh, that's, I just basically, I winged it. Yeah. And at one point, my boss did say, I heard from uh, someone else that, who came out, because journalists would come to the front and they would go. It was only myself and Steve Harrigan and Joel from, um, who actually lived there. And I didn't live with them. Um, and this, someone told me that my uh, TV station in Britain had gotten visas for another correspondent and cameraman, and a cameraman, because I still didn't have a cameraman at this point. And I phoned the news editor, Malcolm, and I said, Malcolm, I hear you got visas for so-and-so. And so. He said, oh, yes, we did. And I said, well, what the fuck do you think you're doing? And he said, well, oh, no, 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 well, they, you know, they're not coming out. And I said, good. I said, because let me tell you something. If you try to send someone else in here, I said, I'll have their fucking chopper shot down. <laughs> I said, there's no other way in. And by the way, these motherfuckers, I'm like their sister now. They yeah. will shoot it down. Yeah. They're crazy enough. <laughs> and if I want it done, they'll do it. Yeah. And he, uh, he laughed. I mean, I don't think they could believe it. But I realized, you know, of course, there's no real hot food um, no real food because you're in a in a war and they, they didn't even fire the ovens up to make bread more than once every two weeks. So the bread was edible for like the first two days. And after that, it was like a weapon. You could have stabbed someone in the face with it. Yeah. And um, and there was no, you know, there's no toilets or anything like that. And um, you're sleeping, you know, in brutal conditions. I mean, I got so many bed bugs. I ended up in an Afghan hospital and passing out unconscious for three days um, just from the antihistamines that the Afghan doctor gave me. 
Um, but I had like, I mean, I was bites from head to toe. What was it? Yeah. <laughs> and someone kept waking me up. Sean Swan, the cameraman, kept waking me up saying, uh, your, your office is on, <laughs> is on the phone. They want to know if you want to come out. And I would say, mm-mm. Yeah. So um, I just, you know, you make do just like a lot of people do, right? You yeah. just make do. And honestly, after doing civil, covering civil wars in Angola and Mozambique, when you're in Africa and you're in a war, like really, there's no supply lines. There's no DFAC. There's no like American medics coming to rescue you. Like there's just nothing. Yeah. And Angola and Mozambique had both been at war for decades. So in those places, like there's no market where you've got a supply line from Pakistan and you can buy some Pepsi. You know, Afghan, Afghanistan in a way it was hard, but for me it was almost like luxury. Yeah. You know, and, and journalists were dropping like flies. Yeah. But I was thinking like, well, I don't want to tell anyone, but this is not so bad. Yeah. So for, in terms of the supplies, I mean, like what were you eating? Were you even eating every day or every few days? And, and what would you eat? Biscuits, stale bread, Pepsi, Pringles, and uh, cream cheese. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> That's what I lived on. Um, I refused to eat goat. Yeah. I used to say to the Afghans, motherfucker, I like you, and I do not want to disrespect your culture, but I am not eating that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? No, no and good. and they, because they, I think because they know that you respect them. They know that from all of their dealings with you. Yeah. So when you really don't want to do that thing yeah. that's so offensive, yeah. you know, the people one says, oh, you got to eat the local food. Yeah. You don't want to offend the locals. Yeah. So, the, But they didn't understand it. Because for Afghans, the idea that you don't eat meat yeah. was uh, foreign beyond foreign yeah. beyond foreign yeah. so they were obsessed with this yeah. every Afghan I ate with I had this conversation probably more than any other conversation um, the two conversations I had the most were uh, when will the Americans bomb the Taliban <laughs> you know because even when the bombing campaign started they were letting the Taliban convoys out of Kabul every night and when and why don't you eat meat? And so eventually I realized, wait a minute, I know what I got to say. I said, it's my religion. Yeah. It's haram in my religion. It's forbidden. You know, and yeah. that made sense. Yeah. Then after that, people stopped yeah. asking me. Yeah, then it's just a free pass because it's, yeah, Jesus. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, it's the, the influence of religion in so many ways. And I mean, in all cultures, it's, it's similar here, just in a very different way. But yeah, uh, that's some fascinating details. Um, so as that as that three and a half uh, months period kind of wraps up, and, and now you have essentially the golden ticket of of being able to pick whatever job, and you go sixty mm-hmm. minutes. Did did you go from that point back to New York, or what what happened at that point? I was still living in London, and my uh, my phone bill for filing I was filing for CBS Radio. That's what I did a lot when I was working for GMTV. Because once the morning news was over, you know, I was still a reporter, but I just didn't have anything any uh, anyone who cared about what I was learning and yeah. seeing. So um, Kimberly Dozier from CBS. She, uh, Kimberly said to me once, she did a lot of radio. She was great at it and a, a big star at CBS Radio and um, then at CBS Television as well after that. But she said to me, if you're, you're ever anywhere interesting, I saw her in Ramallah in the West Bank during the Second Intifada in Israel. And um, she said, if you're ever anywhere interesting and, not, and there's you know, no one else around, file for CBS Radio. So I was doing a lot of CBS Radio. And when, I, when Kabul fell... CBS ended up not having anyone in Kabul. So I had been reporting uh, for radio, and, and I love CBS radio. I got to tell you, that's like one of the greatest organizations I have ever worked for, and one of the most rewarding um, reporting I've, I've done has been for CBS radio, among the most rewarding. And so um, I filed endlessly for them, and I, I got kind of a cult following in places like Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> Where people were listening to me on the radio, you know, yeah. it was, I loved it. And I would sit on the mud roof and, you know, describe what it was like with the sun coming down and the lights of the Taliban cars and, and the convoys coming out and what the Afghans around me were saying and doing. And it was just, it was really, I loved it. So at this point, you know, when Kabul falls, CBS Evening News with Dan Rather gave me a week long contract and I did some work for them. But then their correspondent arrived and uh, made it very clear <laughs> that this annoying little girl uh, around her was uh, a pain in the butt. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, I've done what I need to do. So um, I said to CBS, look, I got a few more days left on this contract, but you don't need me. You got your person here, right? I mean, like, like what do I, like, after everything I'd lived through, I just did not need to be shit on yeah. by some snotty, you know, other uh, insecure TV person, and right? It's like, come on. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I, the only reason I wouldn't tell you is yeah. not to be unkind. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But other than that, I have yeah. no hesitation. Yeah. I, you know. Yeah. Um, anyway, I went back to the UK, and in the course of the negotiations, I got myself an agent who's still my agent to this day, yeah. Carol Cooper. So one of the greatest human beings yeah. um, I've ever been lucky enough to know. Yeah. And um, persuaded Carol to see me, by the way, because she was well, that was no me, that was no small achievement. Yeah. Um, since I'd never actually worked in America. Um, and I was almost going to sign with NBC when uh, Jeff Fager at 60 Minutes 2 at the time uh, said he wanted to meet with me. And my agent said to me, if it was anyone else but 60 Minutes, yeah. you know, because we're that far down the line with NBC, I was about to sign. Um, and once I had that meeting, I didn't look back. I mean... CBS was then sort of natural home for me, 60 Minutes, because one of, the, one of my strengths is the interview, right? Mm -hmm. And what show is greater for that than yeah. an interview-based show like 60 Minutes? Yeah. So it was a natural, I mean, I still had you know, a long way to go in earning my place there, but um, it was a natural fit for me. Yeah. And also, I mean, who didn't want to work for 60 Minutes, right? Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, that's like the, uh, the varsity squad, right? Yeah. I mean, I would say that was it because I spent, you know, stayed there. But it wasn't it in terms of uh, the work and fighting to do what you want and, and, and all the rest of it. I mean, they didn't make it easy for me at CBS or at 60 Minutes. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, obviously you, you did a lot of other things because after that, when the Iraq war kicked off, you know, the, the story that you, if, if you're willing, if you can share it of, of how... Uh, being in Jordan, can you can you get into the details of uh, of how you, how you well, started to cover that? Because you were still with sixty, or obviously you were with sixty minutes at that point. I was with CBS News. I was I was new at CBS. I started with them on the first anniversary of nine eleven in Afghanistan, and the whole drumbeat of war right was uh, um, in Iraq was ramping up, and so we all knew that's where it was headed. And I spent. You know, every minute of my day that I had spared lobbying CBS for me to be the person in Baghdad for that war. And um, no one else really wanted to do it, which I didn't realize at the time and is still a mystery to me. So I went to Iraq for CBS for the last uh, few months, three, four months of Saddam Hussein's um, time as in, in power there. And what was really amazing to me is when I made that decision, I had no intention of ever leaving. <laughs> yeah. Once I decided I wanted, that was what I wanted to do. But unfortunately, the team I had with me of uh, more experienced um, men who had all been with CBS quite some time, except for the one producer, um, had no intention of being there through shock and awe and the invasion. Mm -hmm. And so they... Uh, they really worked hard to fuck me over and prevent me from staying. Yeah. And I had, no, I had no juice, right? I'm a new young correspondent at CBS. And uh, I was just mystified. They came up with every excuse in the book for why we should be pulled out. And uh, none of that really meant anything to me. But what did mean something to me is Dan Rather said to me, you know, I'm really grateful that you're there, so glad, but you know, there's a day when New York says, come out where you've got to listen to New York. You've got to be smart enough to know that day. And um, basically the team decided that uh, they wanted to leave, but they didn't want to say it. And they, we had, they arranged a meeting with the CBS News president. And you can, every day we're reporting, right? And the, the, it's getting closer and closer and closer to the invasion and the fear level and panic and hysteria in Iraq is ratcheting up. Journalists are leaving every day in droves. I mean, it went from thousands of journalists down to maybe 100. Yeah. Um, so every day there were fewer people. And uh, the fear in the streets was palpable. And there was a more and more and more and more and more pressure to leave. And uh, I was still doing the evening news in the middle of all of this. So they, uh, they tell me that there's a conference call with management on the roof. And I go 
and they all saying this stuff, and I just keep quiet because the vice president at the time, Marcy McGinnis, she knew exactly my position because we'd had private conversations. And she phoned me off to the conference hall, and she said, look, Lara, it's very obvious that all these guys went out, but they don't want to say they went out. They're embarrassed. And uh, she said, We've, I've got to make it easy for them. I've got to pull you out because that's the saving, face saving they want. And I was like, okay, I guess this is that moment Dan rather told me about. I said, well, Masi, is there any way I can stay on my own? She said, I'll talk to Andrew Hayward, the president. She came back to me and she said, no, Andrew said, absolutely not under any circumstances whatsoever. So I was still going to do it, to be honest with you, <laughs> <laughs> even though I said I wasn't. Yeah. But by the time I came off air, off the evening news that night, they'd taken all of the supplies They'd taken the tape that we used to cover, the, you know, to put across the windows for bomb blast to minimize the, the uh, shrapnel. I mean, the, you know, the debris. And uh, they'd taken all the reserve water. They had the keys to the safe houses that we had already identified and set aside. They sent away all the local staff. So I had no vehicle. I had no drivers. I had nowhere safe to go. I had no food. I had no water. I mean, they fucked me, Right. As much as you could possibly do, they fucked me. And I realized, okay, so the first planes are flying towards Iraq. And I'm here. I've done, I've done all kinds of wars on my own at that point. I, Angola, in uh, Kosovo, all of that. And I was fully prepared to stay there on my own. But I would have put myself in a position, the best possible position to cover the war. I, at that moment, was in the worst possible position. So I said, okay. I will leave with the guys. And we left, I mean, that was at four in the morning and they left at six. And, um, and the planes literally flew over our heads. And I spent the next week or so in hell on the uh, Jordanian-Iraqi border with, I don't know, a bunch of 20 men from CBS who all snored at the same time. And I got, <laughs> and it was, and nobody was interested or even trying to get back. And CENTCOM warned me, they said, if you go down that road from Jordan, uh, you know, from Amman to Baghdad, we will obliterate you. And we're obliterating everything on the road. And, and uh, the Iraqis were riding TV on the roof of their vehicles to try to stop American bombers and all that. And I, but I realized that our security, because this is when it became really, you know, a thing for journalists to have security, um, who were saying it was madness to go down the road, and our CBS people who were saying it was suicide, they were all lying. Because I had a, a, my producer from 60 Minutes 2, um, not my news producer, was in Paris. And she was seeing French and German and other journalists going down the road. Plus our CBS Jordanian person, who um, he was sending money down the road to pay the Baghdad staff. Mm -hmm. like, so they were all lying. And um, I planted some false information with one of the other journalists to see what would happen because I suspected that all of the security for the American networks were all just talking to each other and that they didn't know anything that was really going on. And sure as nuts, boy, that same information came back to me. You know, one of the CBS people saying, oh, my God, you know what we just found out? And I was yeah. like, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I see how this is. So I, I met a, another journalist from Sky News and we built a convoy and uh, we drove. And when I crossed that, uh, with CBS's permission, I had to go secretly to the vice president of news, and she secretly got the permission of the president of the network to let me go. And uh, the night before I left, no one at CBS would talk to me because they were super mad at that point. I asked for money, they wouldn't give it to me. I asked for a small camera, they wouldn't give it to me. I asked for a, a satellite phone, they wouldn't give it to me. So eventually I had to call the vice president in New York and she called the news um, president in London and, and he had to order the CBS people to give me that and no one even said goodbye it was a very cold <laughs> it was a very cold night for me and yeah. not knowing whether I was going to you know make it back or not but um, I had one the only reason it was possible I left out the most important thing there's a man called Firas Ibrahim Al Samurai an Iraqi who um, came to me when I was in that shithole on the Iraqi-Jordanian border. He came and woke me up in the night and he said, I want to talk to you. I was like, okay. And he took me outside and he said, you want to go to Baghdad? Because everyone knew I was like a crazy person. And he said, I said, yes. And he said, I will take you. And I said, for us, he had just started working for CBS, but he was amazing. 
And all of our illegal equipment in Iraq, like satellite phones and all that, was hidden in the walls of his family home in Baghdad. And, um, and he said, uh, I said, for us, if you go, you know, if they catch you, they'll, they'll kill you. And I said, they're more likely to kill you than me. And he said, a word you will know, inshallah, mm. right? He said, this is my home. And uh, if I'm going to die, I want to die in Iraq. I don't want to die here. And that is what made it possible because for us, he knew the roads, he knew the language, he knew the people, he knew the culture, he knew everything. Yeah. That's all I needed was my, my, you know, my wingman. And um, that's what we did. We drove through the fighting, through the war. I filmed everything. There were vehicles were bombed out on the road. There were bodies. There were craters. There was, you know, there were a lot of his um, very uptight soldiers at checkpoints and a lot of hysteria because especially around Ramadi, that whole area, and Ambao province where you go through when you come along that road, the Iraqis were um, in a bad position and they were taking a lot of casualties. So it was very, it was very touch and go and they wouldn't let us uh, continue down the road. So we had to go around Baghdad and go up to Tikrit and come down. And you remember they had all the tires around Baghdad at the mm -hmm. time and they were burning them, they put oil in them, they were burning them because all the black smoke to make it difficult for the um, American planes. Mm -hmm. So there's Baghdad. I mean, there's this, it's just surrounded with smoke, black smoke rising. The air is thick with smoke. All you can hear is the sound of the bombs dropping and sometimes you can't hear, obviously, the bombers really well, but you can hear the A-10s and the, um, the mini guns because they echo around the city and all those buildings, mm -hmm. that sound, I never forget that sound. And um, a lot of the city's on fire and the sun is going down, and when, when the sun sets in Iraq, it's, in Baghdad, it's like, it's like God is, you know, is lighting a bonfire mm -hmm. on the earth. And people are still fleeing the city. So we were literally, the, the roads out of Baghdad were just flooded with people fleeing, and on the road in, we're the only ones on that road. And the Iraqi army was on the march. So you have just convoys, convoys of artillery pieces and... I mean, every, every heavy weapon that you can think of, and they were marching it out of there. And to this day, I don't know that anyone's ever found all of that stuff yeah. or knows what they did with it. They probably buried it in the desert. Yeah, that or, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming some of it got fucking blown up on the way out. Some of it. You know, but, uh, yeah. Some of it. Yeah, I mean, that, that was, uh, I mean, there was a lot of elements of, of the war at that point where shit was getting three sheets to the wind, you know, not just, oh, yeah. I mean, everything, you know, and so that's uh, Well, and then I spent the next few weeks covering that war on my own, and I was the lead on 60 Minutes 2, and Sunday morning, and the evening news, and the morning news, and I was just me and for us, until they shelled our hotel, the Marines accidentally shelled our hotel and killed some journalists that I knew and injured one journalist, a cameraman who I'd worked with a lot, and then for us, and I had a big fight because he wouldn't help me go to the hospital to try and see if Paul was okay. And Paul was in an Iraqi hospital in the middle of the invasion where they had no electricity and no medical supplies. So um, I was not going to abandon him. Did he get injured in that shelling? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because they hit the Reuters office. Yeah. And, um, and two people, two, a, a Spanish journalist and another journalist, Tarak um, Prostoik, they were both killed. And there were a bunch more that were wounded. And that was very, obviously, that was a big deal for us. It was very traumatic. I helped to write the letter to Teresa's widow and clean the blood off all of his equipment because it was to be sent back to his, his uh, son. He yeah. uh, was eight at the time. So, um, but for us is still today one of the most important people in my life. And when I lived in Iraq for five years, almost everything I did of significance in my time there he made possible, yeah. you know. And when I was um, gang raped in Egypt, he didn't even phone. He just got on a plane. He literally drove to the airport and came straight to my house in Washington, D.C. and stayed with me at my side for two and a half weeks. Jeez. Yeah. So, he, I mean, you still still talk to him all the time, huh? Oh, well, yeah. yeah. And does he still live over there? No, it became too dangerous for him because yeah. of his work, but um, he still works there a yeah. lot. But, you know, the last time I was there with him, I asked Hadi Alamri, you know, who you will know, head of the Badakor Iranian-backed militia, um, about personally 
executing two and a half thousand Sunnis and read him from a diplomatic cable in the US which said his preferred method of killing was to drill holes in their heads while they're still alive. Yeah. So for us, um, came under, we all came under a lot of pressure on that trip and he said to me, Habibi, Habibi, Habibi to you, this question, why this question is a big problem for us. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, he has to be very, very, very careful, you know, sure. but he, but he, um, he is uh, an asylum seeker in the US. He has his green card now. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy shit. I mean, the that that entire five year period. I mean, what what would you say your life was like in terms of the the balance that you had to strike between doing your job and and keeping your fucking sanity? I mean, what was it? I, well, what, first of all, I like? you know some a great a very successful American woman said to me once when I was interviewing her and I asked her about balance. She just laughed and said, of course I don't have balance in my life, right? Yeah. You don't. If you're living in Baghdad, you don't have balance. But the balance you're talking about is really more a question of how do you keep your sanity, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, because, I mean, were you going back and forth? Or no, 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 I just there lived the there. Yeah, I mean, and when I left Baghdad, I would go to Afghanistan yeah. or Darfur. On one trip, I went to, yeah. uh, to Darfur when they were slaughtering people there yeah. i mean because we you know obviously we would we would go back and forth i mean that that was the I, maybe you'd call it a pseudo balance because it, you know sometimes it would make it worse coming back but there's still there's a break you know i mean to spend five i didn't want a break five years what i didn't feel like i needed a break yeah. like I, I mean to me i don't know i just i loved being there so much um and there's always something else to do you know if you're if the basis of doing your job well is to learn and know as much as you can, right? To collect as much knowledge and information and experience and relationships and everything as you possibly can. Every time you do that makes you better able yeah. uh, to understand and explain and, and focus on the right things and all the rest of it. That is a, you know, that job is never done. Yeah. You never reach a point. I don't have defined targets, okay? This is my target. This is my operation. This is what I'm going to do. No, I mean, mm -hmm. my, my job is never ends. Yeah. So I would still probably be living somewhere like that if I hadn't realized that, you know, at a certain point you actually have to stand still <laughs> yeah. and Small have road. a family yeah. and build something else, yeah. right? Yeah. You can't live on the run. Yeah, yeah. But I wouldn't. I I would have lived on the run. Yeah. If I if it had, if I could have. Yeah. No. I mean, you can tell you're drawn to it for sure. But um, do do you miss it? I'm I'm assuming. Yeah. yeah. Don't you? Uh, for sure, I do. I mean, for me, I miss I miss the camaraderie and the and the guys yeah. and the experience. For you know, but there's elements of uh, of the job that I frankly don't miss. I mean, no. a lot of it I do, but more more than anything, I miss uh, I miss the the men that I. I, uh, you know, grew, grew accustomed to being able to count on, you know, no matter what was fucking yeah. going on. But, um, for, for that bouncing back and forth, uh, period from the time you, you started that five year period, can you share a couple of, uh, harrowing experiences that, uh, that you barely made it out of alive just in the Iraq and Afghanistan area of operations? Well, how crazy is this after the, um, bombing campaign in Afghanistan, when I was, uh, uh, on one of my many, many, many trips uh, there, on the 23rd of November, I remember that, the, uh, in the first year after the fall of Kabul, our, the, we were doing left seat, right seat, right. So the unit we were with from the 82nd, uh, uh, from the 10th Mountain Division, sorry, they were, um, they were going out and the new guys were coming in. So the, they were doing the handover, right? And um, we were on Lozano Ridge, which is na who named after an airman who died um, on that particular piece of ground during the initial fighting. And um, we had a big convoy, and our vehicle drove over a double anti-tank mine and was blown to shit. Um, we went 12 feet in the air and eight feet forward is where it landed. The vehicle landed, right? So you imagine what happened to us. We were like little ragdolls that are flying through the sky. But, um, and the, the guy next to me, Staff Sergeant Michael Eichner, Sergeant Michael Eichner, sorry, and Staff Sergeant Roy Mitchell was in the front. He lost his leg and Eichner broke his back and they were the most uh, severely injured. I landed on my 
face, basically, and got buried under a pile of dirt and soldiers and weapons and car parts, you know, and all that. But what's amazing to me is there were 12 of us in the back and two in the front, two soldiers in the front, 12 soldiers in the back, myself and then uh, two other journalists, uh, Carlo Montali and, and David Rhodes from New York Times, and my cameraman producer, Jeff Newton. How do you fit so many vehicle people in a vehicle on a battlefield, right? You know that you only fit that in a, an open cargo, unarmored Humvee. Mm -hmm. They didn't even, we didn't even have armor yeah. on the vehicles. Mike, that's oh, the, yeah. when you think back to that, compared to MRAPs oh, all no. those years later, yeah. right? Yeah. Look what happened over the course of yeah. that war. I mean, that's but, just know, unbelievable, you, right? No, absolutely. I mean, I remember the, the Humvees that we were in. Two, two of the four Humvees that, uh, that my platoon was in didn't have doors on them. You know, they, uh, <laughs> so, you know, so, yeah, I mean, I, the, the meager accommodations were, I mean, sometimes it's hard to even imagine, you know, now with the technology that they have. But hearing that, I mean, running over that, I, I'm, I mean, how the hell did nobody even get killed doing that? Like... We just, we got lucky. I mean, that, that vehicle just went like flying through the sky. And I, uh, I was unconscious for some time. And I remember, uh, I knew it was in mine because of my, my time in places like Angola and Mozambique, which were very heavily mined countries and what I'd seen there. Um, and also the sergeant had just said to me, the roads are, are heavily mined. You know, we, we try to stay off the roads, but mm -hmm. we were forced onto the road at that point. So it was a natural um, site for an ambush. Um, and of course it was chaos and mayhem uh, after that. But every, every gun on that convoy was, was firing. Um, but we just kind of got lucky. And I remember I could hear them at a certain point Everything was white for me. And at a certain point, I could hear my name being called, and it sounded really far away. And, uh, and then I heard someone else say, is she all right? Is she all right? And uh, Jeff Newton, my colleague and one of my best friends, said, no, I think she's dead. And I thought, fuck, they think I'm dead. They're going to leave me here. And then I'm really going to be fucked because there we're in Taliban territory, and we were... You know, we were staying at Shkin, which was at that time supposed to be the most dangerous part of the country. And um, so I tried to talk. And I had blood, you know, pouring out of my mouth and uh, nose and all that. So I was a little bit of a mess. Um, and Jeff told me later that he was actually lying on top of me, screaming at me. He was this far from my face. And I could hear this vague voice somewhere in the distance. Yeah. But then, you know, they kind of dragged me behind some ruins and... Um, and, and I was really, you know, just bashed up, uh, but not, not badly wounded. I mean, I still have cracks and, and things in my jaw and, and my teeth from uh, the force of that. Yeah. But there were other times, I mean, in Baghdad, you know, our hotel was blown up underneath us. Um, and 13 people died, including a five-year-old girl. And that time, I'd, you know, I'd, I was, uh, I'd been up all night. And I'd finally fallen asleep around 6 a.m. Um, and... I remember when I woke up thinking, oh God, you know, I really am so tired, I really want, and I just swung my feet off the bed and put them down and, uh, and, the, and the bomb went off and destroyed the first third, three floors. We were on the second floor, so we were lucky. But um, I remember thinking, shit, I'm in my pajamas, like of all the times for, for a bomb to go off. Now I gotta go on, I can't go on TV in my pajamas. Yeah. This is gonna be hard to explain. Um, but I've been on in other situations, like in, in Iraq, actually, in Ramadi, where I was on patrol with Marines, and we could, you know, all the optics were changing, we knew it was bad, and Ramadi at that time was so, so, so bad. I went there because more Americans were dying there than anywhere else, yeah. and, um, and this, we, we had to run across, um, you know, going through the city. So we were hiding behind buildings, but there was a road. And so we do as you know, both the Marines would take a knee and you tap him on the shoulder, he runs. And I tapped, uh, I tapped the guy and he ran and he took like two steps and, um, and they, sh they shot him in the leg. So they were set up at that point. That was a, not a great, uh, that we were right in the kill zone of a pretty um, intense ambush. So uh, I had just, you know, I just, I just watched him drop like that and then we had to get him back so that was uh that was a, a sticky one yeah. but i have to say one of the worst was in the battle for mosul um because 
we went, we were surrounded by ISIS positions. We were with Iraqi counterterrorism forces <coughs> right at the uh, front as they were. And then we were inside the city, but you know, they still, ISIS still had at least, I don't know, 70, 75, maybe 80% of the city at that point. And um, we went to where they just got, we were trying to get to where they had a couple, taken a couple prisoners. And the, our building had already been hit by a suicide um, bomber in a you know, vehicle borne IED which was packed with one of those armor-piercing, I mean, insane bombs, just okay, a traveling, yeah. it's like a truck just filled with explosives and, and a suicidal lunatic behind yeah, the wheel. Yeah. So when I that had just, that had hit the building the day before, hmm. and, um, you know, that's a, yeah, you either get lucky there or you don't, right? Yeah. And if you don't, it's really, 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 really bad. So, um that next day and we were trying to get to those prisoners and either a, a marksman, everyone says sniper, but I think they show, throw that word around very yeah. loosely, right? Yeah. Let's just say someone with a long range weapon who was very determined was following every footstep we made. And that was one of the, that was one of the worst feelings because it's one thing to be in an attack or an ambush where there's a lot of shooting going on and there's a lot of targets. Yeah. But when you're running from building to building or cover to cover and as you're running that sound yeah i think the, i think the psychological impact that that has is is much more profound than than the hornet's nest being kicked over of an ambush you know that cause it just seems like it's much more personal well, also it was a holy fuck i like i this motherfucker is actually following me yeah. and like and i'm tired <laughs> like my body's slowing down wait what's happening the adrenaline is not propelling me forward like a gazelle yeah. in fact if anything i think i'm fucking slowing down and <laughs> i actually think i can't breathe yeah yeah no i mean it's the the experiences that you that you went through there are are i mean there's thousands of them um the, there's one that i remember that you uh that you, you touched on years ago, uh, and I'll, I'll probably fuck up the uh, the recollection of it, but it was something to the effect of a of a certain uh, male that was in a position of power that was trying. Uh, I think he was trying to oh, yes. to kidnap you. Or, you uh, could you share that one before we uh, before we move on? Well, to the that next was chapter? a tricky one because he wasn't so much trying to kidnap me as trying to sleep with me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, he was in Basra, and um, Basra at that time was. Um, and still is really Iranian controlled, right? And so the Iranian militias were really the most powerful force down there. And for some reason, they were targeting women. And there was, um, I mean, there were just dozens and dozens of women being murdered every week. And the bodies were just piling up for offenses, such as wearing makeup in public and that kind of thing. So they had the big, what they called the death mosque of Basra was pretty much in control. And, you know, the Mehdi army, Muqtada al-Sada's Mehdi army was strong down there at the time. And we went down to the death mosque to interview the imam. And that was intense because I had to be covered from head to toe. I mean, and when I say covered, I mean covered in traditional conservative black robes, not the like the cute, like Bollywood kind of, you know, (laughs) headscarf and gold glittery sort of, you know, flowing sexy, you know, no, this was like, Mm, Not the, the vanilla Muslim. This was, yeah, yeah, this was the black tent of yeah. from hell yeah. because it is a hundred million degrees and I was sweating like a beast and dehydrated beyond like anything. So my head is pounding, everything in my body is pounding, I'm trying not to vomit. And um, if even so much as a single hair escapes, they stop the whole interview and all these very intense, unsmiling, you know, men. Uh, you know, who don't want to look at you in the eye because it'll make them dirty, you know, they call in this band of women who will come and adjust the headscarf and all the rest of it. And, you know, they'd admonish me in very serious tones. And um, and the imam was just the most painful interview because, he, A, he was lying about everything, and, B, he was... Um, when anyone starts an interview with a religious intonation, you know that every answer is going to be very, 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 very long. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Plus you're going through translation. Yeah. So it was tough. And at one point I realized, wow, this guy, this guy actually does understand English because he's starting to answer the questions before the translation is finished. So I told him, why don't you just stop fucking around? And if you feel like you actually want to answer one of these questions, honestly, we could just start the interview again. How about we do that? 
And my translator's like, I'm not translating that. And I'm like, that's okay. This motherfucker speaks English just fine. He knows exactly what I said. Yeah. Anyway, the, the Iraqi uh, commander who let us stay with them down there on this very dangerous trip uh, had a little uh, infatuation with me, I guess you could say, and um, would make me come to his bedroom at night and wear his pajamas and drink whiskey with him and he would always make sure there was porn on the television so I would like beg one of the guys to come with me <laughs> but you know, you know Is it like I, a western western porn I'm not you know I've tried really hard not to look <laughs> yeah. so I would uh, comfortably tell you that I have no idea yeah. but you know it yeah. doesn't sort of take uh, much to identify sure. that as, you know, yeah. as the fleeting glance yeah. and people would say well why would you be there and how could you put up with that and whatever he was uh I mean, that was our safety net, yeah. right? I mean, that was keeping all of us alive. So yeah. I didn't really have a whole bunch of, a whole lot of choice. And he had, that was the downside, but there were also other upsides. Like, you know, you had food and you had... Uh, protection. Protection and yeah. all of that. So anyway, one, uh, one of the guys I, I've worked with a lot, who's um, one of my closest friends in the world and one of the best journalists I've ever known, Richard Butler, we negotiated with our... Contact our Mehdi Army contact General Falcon was his code name, self given by the way, not <laughs> given by us. We had uh, negotiated with General Falcon access to Muqtadr al Sada, who was that was a big deal at the time because yeah. you know the the, um, the fight in Najaf with the Americans and all mm -hmm. the rest of it. So Sada was a big deal, and he hadn't done any interviews with anyone. And Richard said to me at the last minute, uh, Let me go down to Basra and clear the way, make sure everything's okay. And I said, well, I want to go with you. And he said, no, it's my job to make sure that, that uh, we're good here. I'm not bringing you in until I know, till I'm satisfied that it's good. So, and if you know Richard, it's hard to argue with Richard. So I gave in. And unfortunately, you know, on that first trip, that Iraqi general had, well, he'd come and pound on my door in the night. So that was a little more disconcerting even than having to wear his pajamas. Um, and Richard, recognizing what was happening, uh, stacked all the camera cases that he could outside my door and would sleep on them at night. And, um, you know, you never know for sure, um, but we were told by people who had the ability to track these things that that had been an ongoing issue for that particular individual who was actually working for the Iranians, even though the British and the Americans thought he was working really for them and for Iraq. Um, but he, uh, so when Richard went back down there to do that story, he was, he liaised with that individual who he thought was, you know, a, a trusted person, a safe person. Yeah. And uh, he didn't, he uh, basically had the Iranian militias. He sold Richard out to the Iranian militias who yeah. took him that night, him and our Rocky fixer from the hotel and imprisoned him for three and a half months and uh, chained him to a radiator. And at, at one point for three days, put him inside a wall and plastered the wall around him. So no, sure. it was, um, that was... Uh, not an not a you know an insignificant um, event in all of our lives. Yeah. I mean, even though Richard made it home to this day, you know, he has a lot of problems with his shoulder and other things. But yeah. he did send me a um, a photograph a few months ago because this that was years ago, right? He sent me this thing on WhatsApp, which had a big picture of a double layered chocolate cake with candles <laughs> and everything, and it said, "Avoid kidnapping, eat more cake." <laughs> <laughs> and Richard's note was, thanks yeah. for fucking telling me. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's, uh, you know, again, it's just every story you have is it could be its own fucking movie. But Oh, don't worry. When that guy came, when Richard was hostage and he came to Baghdad and he promised me he had information and we didn't know he was involved. I mean, you know, he, he, he Richard's best friend and, and Jeff Newton and I went to meet with him and let's just say there were some interesting things. I mean, he, yeah. you know, he, he, uh, he drugged us. And, Through the booze or? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I thought I was funny giving, uh, stealing Jeff's wine. So I got like a double dose. Double. Yeah. That was, so that, that was, yeah, another night that almost ended very badly in yeah. Baghdad. Jesus. The, the time that you spent there, um, and, and obviously hindsight's twenty twenty, but I would say, you know, collectively as, as a nation, as a, uh, as, as a society, as a Western people, 
Um, what is your take looking reflectively back on the Iraq war as a whole? Well, it's no, you know, it, it was obvious to us uh, on the ground at the time that, that, uh, the, the weapons inspectors were, you know, very non-committal. It was hard to get to a sense of what the real situation was. And the popular sort of understanding of the Iraq war now is that the Bush administration lied. They didn't find anything. And the whole thing was a disaster. From my personal point of view as a, as a professional journalist, I always knew that the whole um, suggestion that the U.S. was going into Iraq because of al-Qaeda um, was not true because Saddam Hussein had uh, very tight control over that country. And the only al-Qaeda presence um, at the time of the invasion was in the north, in Kurdistan, with a, an organization called Ansar al-Sunnah, was al-Qaeda's satellite organization there. So, uh, so that was an obvious lie to me, and I reported that repeatedly. Um, people were very skeptical about weapons of mass destruction, but we couldn't really get to the truth because the inspectors were never firm one way or the other. What struck me most was that Iraq, under, uh, after 12 years of sanctions, was in a very, very, very bad way mm -hmm. and, um, and had really suffered. It had fallen apart. And Saddam had cynically used the sanctions. He had done nothing to mitigate the effect of sanctions. And he had, in fact, had done a lot to make um, to amplify the effect because that um, and blame the Americans for that because that was to turn Iraqi people against the Americans. So I was never, I'm not, I didn't believe my job as a journalist was to support or, you know, or be for or against the war. And I was shocked mm -hmm. actually to see what a lot of my colleagues were doing. And I was shocked to see a lot of journalists wearing uniforms. But my sense of it always was that the invasion of Iraq was not like um, U.S. bombing campaign in Afghanistan, which had a direct link to 9-11. The link to 9-11 was sort of fabricated and exaggerated, but I still believe that we don't fully know uh, everything about Iraq's um, weapons capabilities at the time, because I think there's a lot of stuff that was, went on that is, was hidden. Yeah. Um, but the war was a disaster from the point of view of uh, the Americans played right into Iran's hands and they played into the hands of Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. They brought the fight onto their turf and, um, and the way it was done turned you know, people all over the world and especially in that country against the U.S. It gave Al-Qaeda time to observe the U.S. up close and to perfect um, their, their, their way of fighting in um, the U.S., it, and it achieved much more of their goals ever than it did anything for the U.S., right? Yeah. It was a disaster from that point of view. What I think is very poorly reported and, and um, not well understood, and basically I think we're, in the media especially, we're willfully blind to it, and in the U.S. we're politically blind to it, is that the, um, the withdrawal of all U.S. forces under um, Obama was... Uh, just as damaging and arguably more damaging as the invasion itself yeah. because we abandoned all the institutions that we helped to create and build. We abandoned all the ideas that we asked people to believe in. We abandoned all the people that, um, that took a chance and did that for us. I mean, you know, the Sunnis that, that turned on Al-Qaeda and fought side by side with American forces, what did we do? We abandoned them. Yeah. You know, the institutions like free press and, you know, independent, well, not independent, but newspapers and television stations and journalists, you know, that we tried to, we asked them to buy into the idea of a free press. We abandoned all those people. We turned our back on them. We didn't just pull out, um, you know, militarily. We pulled out diplomatically and politically and in every possible way. I mean, we left a skeleton staff on the ground and the Iraqi, the American ambassador to Iraq just before the fall of Mosul in December before Mosul fell the, in the spring of the following year, was doing the rounds on Capitol Hill, begging people to listen to him, saying that Iraq is you know, one battle away from falling apart. And no one on the Hill was listening to him. He couldn't get the White House to pay attention. He couldn't get State Department. He couldn't get national security. I mean, so um, it, there's a far greater uh, betrayal and uh, era of judgment and 
there's much more to that decision than has been superficially addressed and reported by us as a as a society and and also by the media and so i feel that we've been extremely negligent and dishonest yeah. in that capacity and so i mean the the you know the precondition the, the reasons for the invasion never made sense to me I don't understand it the consequences have been terrible and very damaging not to mention the cost to many iraqis Another thing, area where I think we're very dishonest in our rewriting of that war is to suggest that no Iraqis wanted that to happen and no Iraqis benefited from it. For every Iraqi who suffered because of the invasion, you can find an Iraqi who also benefited tremendously. You know, um, just look at what happened to the Shia. You know, the Shia now control almost every institution in Iraq mm -hmm. and they controlled nothing um, under Saddam Hussein. They have a future now. They didn't have a future then, you know, so on. Yeah. So I just... I, for me, it bothers me that we simplify things and, and create narratives that are not um, reflective of the whole truth. Yeah. And um, the damage that we did to all of our relationships worldwide when we abandoned the Iraqis and pulled out, because they see it as abandonment, right? Was we sent a message that we're, we can't be relied upon. And the saying today in Iraq is that the only thing worse than having America as an enemy is to have America as your friend. And in Afghanistan, they say the same thing. Yeah. You know, we go in, we make promises, we break them, we don't keep them, and we um, betray people, we abandon them. And then when we, when, you know, Mosul falls and we got to find ISIS, we go back in and we yeah. wonder why people aren't lining up, right? Now, yes, you can always get people to take the money, take the weapons, take the help that they need. But are those truly relationships that count are they ones that will hold up are those truly our allies that's what you know the fall of uh mubarak meant mm -hmm. to all of the other mubaraks around the world who had actually been helping and working with the u.s right oh you don't stand by your friends mm -hmm. i'm not arguing for a different policy i'm giving the point of view uh, how it looks to people from the other side sure so for me um for me, with abandoning Iraq and withdrawing from there is just as damaging as, as you know, the original decision to invade. And, um, and there's very little that we've gained from either of those two things. But let's not suffer under any kind of delusion that ISIS was created because, um, uh, you know, because of the invasion of Iraq, right? Nonsense. ISIS, first of all, they're the same guys who are Al-Qaeda in Iraq who were in that war predates the invasion of Iraq. Mm -hmm. Okay, that didn't begin in Iraq. That began with Osama bin Laden and um, the ideology of Al-Qaeda that, that he uh, created, in, which was a combination of the Palestinian philosopher, philosopher Abdul Azam and the manifesto written by one of the Qutub brothers of the Muslim Brotherhood in an Egyptian prison when he was in prison there, right? So, and so for people who... who uh, like to say politically it's convenient for us to blame it all on Bush and the Republicans and say all this started because we invaded Iraq. Actually, go back to the first fatwa from Osama bin Laden, right? Look at the bombing of the Koba Towers. All of those events predate the invasion of Iraq and they're all part of this, the same war. Yeah. Um, so looking back on it, I just feel um, I'm not surprised we're still there in some form or another and um, we don't have good answers We've not addressed the situation with Iran. The Shiite, the Iranian-backed Shiite militias or the popular mobilization forces that we were sort of sort of fighting alongside at the time that Washington, you know, Brett McGook, Obama's presidential envoy, is trying to sell those people as patriots who are fighting for their country. The Iranian ambassador to Iraq is telling me, oh, we killed you guys. We're not on the same side. Hmm. We just happen to be fighting the same people right now. We killed you before and we can't wait to kill you again. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's what they're saying on camera. Yeah. Not even hiding it. It's yeah. not some secret information I have. If I know it, you got to know the U.S. knows it, right? Yeah. The U.S., the, the powers, the administration at the time knows it. This administration knows it. And the one before knew it too, let me tell you, because um, they were the ones in power when, when the Ir Iranians were killing Americans in Iraq the first time around. Yeah. So um, well, what is my feeling looking back on it? I mean, it's a, a disaster, but what bothers me most is the dishonesty in the way it's remembered and portrayed. Is yeah. We have partial history, convenient partial history, and well, not 
a real one. Yeah, I mean, I agree, and it's my my question because of that that statement. I guess is whether it's Syria, whether it's ISIS, the pullout, the withdrawal. It seems like, and I know you know, I tend to lean more on the right uh, or conservative viewpoints, but certainly wouldn't necessarily consider myself a, a staunch Republican. But the overwhelming majority of the media, just as as you as you mentioned, the way that the the withdrawal the hasty withdrawal out of Iraq and the problems that that caused arguably more detrimental than the invasion itself tends to be uh, reported on, remembered with rose glasses much more that way when it comes to a democratically led or, or a liberal sided yeah, uh, ideology. I agree with that. And, and, that's true. And so I'm curious, you know, from my perspective, that's a huge fucking problem in this country. Yes. Is, is, <laughs> and my- is, is, is how, how left, how left leaning the, the media is. Uh, and and, yeah. and I, I would ask a couple of things is that, you know, to me, it, it's a surprise that that Trump got elected in, in some ways, in some ways it's not. But, you know, given given the the backlash and the, and the uphill battle that mm. that that our society faces as it relates to the media and how powerful they are, whether it's Facebook, Twitter or, or most of the mainstream media outlets and just how absurdly left leaning they are as a journalist one like how do you combat that and two what you know where do you even fucking go from there well this is a very um important thing to talk about to me and also one that i feel very painfully because um it makes it makes my life hell to be honest um i am I, you know, I don't like cages. And for me, parties and labels and all of that, they're cages, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? I mean, so I don't identify as, uh, I, I don't identify myself politically like that. I've just always been that way. I know what's right and I know what's, I know what's good and what's not good. And when I meet people, I'm not looking at what party you belong to, you know, or, or defining you because of where you live. Oh, you live in California. You must be, you know, crazy liberal or whatever. You live in Texas. You got to be a right wing racist redneck, right? Republican kind of thing. I hate those stereotypes. Um, first of all, they're just ridiculous. And secondly, they're not honest. And thirdly, they get wielded like weapons um, to silence people. So this conversation can be had on several different levels. One is an emotional level, perception, how we feel about it, all of that, my personal experiences. But maybe the best place to start is with the facts, right? You say the media is mostly liberal. Do I agree with that? Does everyone listening agree with that? What's our position on that? I agree with you. It's true. Why? Why can I say that with certainty? Well, first of all, because I've, I've You know, I've been part of this for all my life. I'm 47 now, and I've been a journalist since I was 17. And um, and the media everywhere is mostly liberal, not just in the U.S. But in this country, 85% of journalists are registered Democrats. So that's just a fact, right? No one's registering Democrat when they're rarely a Republican. So the facts are on the side of what you just stated. Most journalists are are left or liberal or Democrat or whatever word you want to give it. I always joke that the other 14% were too lazy to register. (laughs) And there's maybe 1% that's um, on the right. That's a joke. But really, when you think about it, I visually, anyone who's ever been to Israel and been to the Wailing Wall has seen that the women have this tiny little spot in front of the wall to pray. And the rest of the wall is for the men. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a great representation of the American media is that, you know, in this tiny little corner where the women pray, you've got Breitbart and Fox News and, uh, you know, a few others. And then from from that, from there on, you have CBS, ABC, NBC, Huffington Post, Politico, whatever, right? All of them. And that's a problem for me because... Even if it was reversed, if it was, you know, vastly, mostly, you know, right on the right and a little bit, that would also be a problem for me. What I, my experience has been that the more, um, the more opinions you have, the more uh, ways that you look at everything in life, everything in life is complicated. Everything is gray, right? Nothing is black and white. Mm-hmm. You never have a fight, even the ones where you really think that you're in the right, where you're right about everything. So someone very smart taught me, 
a long time ago that how do you know you're being lied to? How do you know you're being manipulated? How do you know there's something not right with the coverage? When they simplify it all, and there's no gray. There's no gray. Mm -hmm. It's all one way. Well, life isn't like that. If it doesn't match real life, it's probably not something's wrong, mm -hmm. right? So, um, for example, you know, all the coverage on Trump all the time is negative. There's nothing, there's, there's nothing, uh, no mitigating policy or event or anything that has happened since he was elected that is out there in the medias that you can read about, right? Well, that tells you that's distortion of the way things go in real life. So I, my starting point is, okay, if I want to find the truth, where do I begin? I begin there and I investigate from that point onwards. It's got nothing to do with whether I like Trump or don't like Trump, right? Or whether I believe him or don't believe in him or identify with him, don't, whatever. I don't even want to have that conversation because I approach that the same way I approach anything. I find that is not a popular way to work in the media today. Because although the media has always been, historically, always been left-leaning, we've abandoned um, our, our pretense, or at least the effort, to be objective today. The former executive editor of the New York Times has a book coming out, Jill Abramson, and she says we would do, I don't know, dozens of stories about Trump every single day, and every single one of them was negative. She said, we, be, we have become the anti-Trump paper of record. Well, that's not our job. That's a political position. That means we've become political activists, in a sense, and some could argue propagandists, mm -hmm. right? And there's some merit to that. So it doesn't mean that everything that's written is untrue. It doesn't mean that, uh, you know, it doesn't say anything about where I stand on it. I do my job today the same way I've always done it. Whether I'm reporting for CBS Radio or a newspaper in South Africa or 60 Minutes, um, my process doesn't change. I am consistent. Hopefully I get a little better at it, but regardless, I am consistent. So if I'm doing my job exactly the same way today that I've always done it, and suddenly today that makes me a Nazi and a fascist and, you know, some kind of Trump lunatic, I'm like, how did we get there? So it's bad enough that in the media we lean towards one side of the political spectrum or we favor one ideology. But you could argue that that's just a function of the way it is and that there's enough good journalism out there and there's enough in, you know, accountability that we at least get a decent representation of the truth a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. I don't even see that happening today, and right? When, and when it does, you're, you're a fascist or you're crazy or... Or how would you even know? Yeah. Because at this point, you know, the level of mistrust in the media is, um, is so high and people really don't know what to trust anymore, yeah. what they can rely on. Yeah, I mean, the... Uh, the, the coin uh, the trump coin phrase the fake news you know like i mean it's started as a joke but christ it really is kind of that way i mean it, just like you said there's so many times especially if it's from a specific news outlet you know specifically say yes. msnbc i mean you can you can rest the fuck assured that it's going to be you know they're going to cherry pick the, the most yes significantly negative components to the well, story and people would counter that by saying well fox is going to do all the positive yeah. stuff but this is the problem that i have there's one fox yeah there's one Fox, yeah. and there's many, many, many more organizations on the left. So if you say, well, you know, people, are, you know, they, they're lying about this, and there's propaganda and whatever, and they're pushing their viewpoint. Oh, well, the other side does that too. Yes, both sides do terrible things. Both sides lie, both sides manipulate, both sides, you know, uh, push their point of view. But the problem is that the weight of all of these organizations on one side of the political spectrum. Yeah. When you turn on your computer or you walk past the TV or you see a newspaper headline in, you know, in the grocery store, if they're all saying the same thing, the weight of that convinces you that it's true. Yeah. You don't question it yeah. because everyone is saying it. Yeah. And, um, and unless you seek out Breitbart on your computer, you're probably not even going to know what 
the other side is saying, right? Yeah, yeah because it's not just mainstream media, right? It's it's social media. I mean, it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. All, yes. all, all of it is, is, I mean, even Google for that matter. You know, which, And we don't even question yeah, if which, what we see on social media yeah. is real or yeah. not. We don't even question if a grassroots movement is really grassroots. You know, yeah. there's a way to start a grassroots movement. Yeah. You write an algorithm and you create all this outrage, yeah. right? And you basically, you're throwing out all the sparks that light the fire yeah. so then it becomes a grassroots movement because it takes nothing yeah. to set to, to set that in motion but did it really begin as one yeah. and if it didn't begin that way if it was manipulated and paid for by someone and serves someone's political purpose is it really what we believe it is oh well people were so moved or they were so outraged that they all rose up mm. and stood up against it no, people were manipulated into doing that. Yeah. And it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. So why that matters is because who's behind it? Mm -hmm. Who's doing it? And why are they doing it? And what else are they doing? Yeah. Those things are profoundly significant. Yeah. And we're not even trying to find out who it is, yeah. right? That really bothers me. Yeah, well, it's, it's, so it's, it's very uh, 1984 Orwellian. My question to you as a journalist is that where do you go from here? How how do you even try to fix something like that? Do you have do you have any any? It's the bane of my existence, yeah. Mike. <laughs> really, it's the it's the uh, shadow yeah. that I um, have lived with for uh, years now. I didn't even notice that there was a bias in the media. People would say it to me all the time, and I argued passionately and ferociously against that. Because I really believe that, you know, when we when we do it well, and the, and the majority of serious journalists were all trying to do their best to overcome those biases and rely on the facts and and good systems. You know, we, you know, we have few conventions, if you like, because they're not really rules, but that you need at least two first-hand sources for something, right? Those things help keep you, um, you know, keep your work to a certain standard. Those, are, those standards are out the window. I mean, you read one uh, story after another or hear it, and it's all based on one anonymous administration official, a former administration mm -hmm. official, right? I mean, nothing. that's just, that's not journalism, that's horseshit. Yeah. Sorry, that yeah. is absolute horseshit. And, um, and so how do you overcome it is a very complex question. It's not a simple question. If there was an easy answer to that, I would probably be doing that. Mm -hmm. I've thought about, you know, I believe, and based on my experience, that people on all sides of the polit political spectrum really do want to know the truth. That even when they don't like the truth or it makes their lives more difficult, people realize that it's better to deal with the truth and come to terms with it and, and uh, overcome it if you can than it is to, be, to live a lie. Mm -hmm. And um, it really doesn't matter whether people sometimes... You know, I'm talking to people who agree with a lot of what I believe in. Sometimes I'm not. But over and over and over again, people say to me, why aren't there more journalists saying this kind of stuff? Why aren't there more journalists who want to doing the work that you're doing? Why aren't there more journalists, um, you know, owning this? Because I always say the responsibility for fake news begins with us. If we, uh, we bear some responsibility for that and we're not taking ownership of that and addressing it, we just want to blame it all, you know. Um, on somebody else and and that's not how life works yeah. right yeah. it's not how life works um so again that analogy is that how it is in real life yeah. no so why is it like that in this case yeah. so i do think that um that people have to journalists have to stand up and we have to back each other and um and i don't mean you know backing someone uh being rude at a press conference at the White House, because quite frankly, I haven't seen a lot of that kind of behavior in my lifetime. I never saw someone treat George Bush like that. And I say that to my colleagues and they say, well, George Bush never treated us the way, you know, this president does. And I say, well, yeah, but I don't tell my kids, oh, that kid's an asshole. So you can just be an asshole to him, right? Yeah. I tell my kids, you have to be consistently live to the standards that you know, that you have set for yourself. And even when someone's an asshole to you, you still have to be the better person and a good person and you have to rise above it and not sink to their level. So what happened to that, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, it's not, you know, the problem is today that when you do try to do, to stand apart from this, 
from the crowd, from the mass of the media, right? And stray, if your narrative strays from the, the narrative that's really being pushed politically more than anything else, you, you're instantly a target. Like I made one random comment about Benghazi in one hour and a half presentation that lasted seconds, basically. I mean, if it was a minute, I, I, I doubt it was a minute, but I've never actually timed it. And that was used to say that I should never have reported on Benghazi because I was biased. But you've got journalists standing up and saying, this president is a danger to all of us. He's the most you know, terrifying, terrible thing to have come out along in a long time. We have to take a position against him and make sure you know, that, that he doesn't continue to harm all of us. And they're seen as independent and objective. Yeah. Well, that's ridiculous. So there's so much, but no one's going to argue with that. Yeah. with what they're saying because they they want because be they there. want that and they control or have influence over or effect or have sympathetic ideological you know uh, beliefs as people across the vast majority of the media yeah. so that's the problem is that you get targeted i was targeted by media matters for america who was um an organization that was established by david brock who is who has dedicated himself uh, to the Clintons mm -hmm. um, because he lied about them during the Whitewater investigation and the rest of his life has been dedicated um, to them. Yeah. And it was their a known propaganda organization who said that their stated intent was to destroy anyone who they saw as a threat to Hillary Clinton's bid for power. Mm -hmm. So when I happened to do a story about Benghazi that honestly I can tell you with absolute sincerity was really nothing to do with Hillary Clinton for us, which is maybe stupid to people listening to that, naive. But it, that began for us as a story about, you know, two Delta guys who begged everyone in Tripoli for money and hired a plane and flew into Benghazi and went to save people yeah. without ever being ordered to do so. Yeah. And that's why I did that story. You know, I wasn't thinking about Hillary and the election. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about an untold story yeah. that nobody else um, knew about. And, and, um, and I waded into political territory very um, naively and paid for that heavily. Yeah. But nothing that was said about me in the wake of that was true, right? None of it was true. But because you have social media where these days, you know, anyone can accuse you of anything yeah. and you can't, you can't defend yourself. Well, and it sticks until you prove it otherwise, you know. And how do you prove it otherwise? Yeah. How do I prove that I'm not, um, yeah. you know, against Hillary Clinton or, you know, Republican or whatever? Why should I have to prove that, first yeah. of all? And anyway, what if I was like a Republican, right? Would that be so evil? I mean, I'm not. And I'll never join a political party. And I probably will never vote in this country because... Because I, that would be used against me. To me, that would be career suicide, right? I'm never going to do that because I can't. Because I don't, I don't care who's in power in terms of doing my job, right? That's not my, pro that's not my business. It's not, not so much that it, it, it impacts what I do, of course, and I pay attention to it. But it's not about what I want. My job is to try to get to the truth um, and to find out how to tell this story in the way that matters most and is the most honest. Because we can be very manipulative and very dishonest when every one of our facts is correct, right? Mm -hmm. At 60 Minutes, often we would say, after going through a script 400 million times, we would do it again just before we go to air and say, is it fair to say this? Is this right? And we challenge each other, right? And sometimes you would defend something or someone on the team would defend something and you would say, no, no, this is true and this is true and this is true and we got it from here and we got it also from there. And so, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And I, and I remember more than once, many times, looking at someone and saying, but we're giving the impression that this is the truth, that this is what's true. Like, the way that sentence is written or where it comes in the story or the amount of time we're spending on this issue, it's giving people the impression that something else is true. And we don't know that, that that's true. Or we know that's not true. Sometimes we actually do know mm -hmm. that's not true. So we, we may have the fact, but the way we've used it in the story, we've been exceptionally dishonest. 
Sometimes intentionally, sometimes not intentionally, right? So there's lots of ways to be manipulative or to be dishonest or to create perception, right? Without having the facts. And, and not everyone has the luxury sometimes when you're rushing to air to, to think about that and to go through it and to work at that level, right? But um, this idea that we're just the innocent bearers of the truth today and we're being unfairly attacked and we're under siege like never before and unprecedented times and all those hyperboles, breathless hyperboles that I hear all the time, they make me crazy. But none more so than the idea that it's never been more important than now for us to do our jobs. No, it's like I've done my job to the best of my ability from the moment I started this job when I didn't have any idea what I was doing. I will do it to the best of my ability till the day I die. And it doesn't, if, if you know, whoever's in power, it's going to be the same. This idea that we need to now be professional and vigilant. No, we always need to be professional and vigilant. We always need to have moral courage. Yeah. We always need to be, you know, um, diligent. It's like, that's just the biggest cop out ever. Yeah. And, I, and I've never seen myself as a victim. So this idea that we're the victim of this evil guy who's turning everyone against us. People gravitate towards the truth. They know what's real and what's not real ultimately, and, uh, and I'm responsible for my own actions. I concentrate on what I can do to be better and to be honest and to stand up for what I believe in, and I don't let people define me and nobody owns me. Yeah. And you would think that that would be really popular in the media, right? Yeah. Well, it should be, but... You know, but it ain't. But it's, yeah, it's come full circle to, uh, to how you were raised, right? And, and I want to say really, really, really loudly. One ideological perspective on everything never leads to an open, free, diverse, tolerant society, yeah. right? The more opinions and views and people and, you know, of, of all everything that you have, the better off we all are. And so creating one morally defensible position, one ideological position on everything throughout your universities, throughout academia, you know, at, in school, in college, in academia, in media, in everywhere else. That's what concerns me. Mm-hmm. I'm, you know, I don't have to agree with everybody. And I don't mind telling you if I don't agree with you. I'll always listen and try to understand, but I don't mind telling you. I'll be, I'll be straight up. But what bothers me is not that it's the left or the right. What bothers me is that it's one ideological position, one ideological view of everything. And if you, if you have any, if you move off that narrative in any direction, you're worthless. Yeah. And that is, wow, how did we get there? Yeah. To me, the, um, as a kind of an outsider from a media standpoint and a political person looking in, to me, to, you know, sometimes something I say a lot is uh, some of the world's most complex problems actually require the simplest solutions. And I think with this, what it makes me think of is is just, you know, to to oversimplify it, it, it really bo- um, boils down to accountability. Is that if whether it's politics or reporters, is that if you, if you hold your own side yes. as accountable as you would the other, everybody wins. Yes. You know, it, it, well, that's what the First Amendment is about, yeah. right? Free speech isn't about, you know, what all of like. us like blowing off steam. Yeah. I mean, uh, what it's really there for is accountability. Yeah. That's the purpose of it. Yeah. So um, you realize that when you see people break the law, for example, and if they're not held accountable, then they didn't break the law. Yeah. They walk. Yeah. So um, that's, I agree with you. Accountability. Um, is so, so profoundly important and significant. And that is why we're here as journalists. We're here not to hold people accountable as a substitute for the rule of law or for the courts. Trial by media, um, while it may have its, its moments where, you know, sometimes if you can't find justice anywhere and um, and this is the only, you know, this, this is the only way really to go from injustice to justice, that's one thing. But um, what we what we seem to be doing today is substituting um, the law and the courts for trial by media, and that is um, that is 
really that really disturbs me. That bothers me a lot. Keeps yeah. me up a lot at night. I don't want to say terrifies me because we're in the age of of hyperbole at the moment, and I can't stand um, you know words like unprecedented are thrown around constantly. These are unprecedented times, really. So you know, go on heading into you know the Vietnam War or during the uh, you know the communist trials in America and at other points in history, there's never been yeah. a, a time yeah. more important than this one yeah. or more difficult or more yeah. whatever. Like, this is what this is what we do today. This is what bothers me. We're told over and over and over again that America is so divided, mm. right? We're in, we're in this terrible situation right now because we're so divided. Um, and we all accept that, that we're divided. But if you think about it, 40% of the electorate is in the middle, right? And always, and has been for a very long time. All the elections in our, live in our lifetime and in memory, most of them, not all, but most of them have been close, right? There's no landslides. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, land, the last time there was a landslide was decades ago. So if elections are won by the narrowest of margins, well, that tells you we're not divided, doesn't it? I mean, I guess there's there's multiple ways you can look at it. Can you... Uh... Is there something new? Is there a new issue? I mean, uh, you know, abortion is not new. Race is not new. I mean, uh, um, immigration is not new. I mean, yes, people have strong feelings about these things and they disagree. But um, I don't believe we are so divided. I just, I think that what's happening is every day we're amplifying the differences. Sure. And we're... You know, we're, we're focusing on those things and making them seem as if they represent the whole. And yeah. that's there's a lot of things that we agree on. Yeah, I mean, when you when you have there's a couple of things. I think when you have social media and its ability to give people two things. One yep. is is time to to respond. Yep. Instead of off the cuff, and I think more importantly, uh, the other thing is is a lack of accountability is whether it's anonymity or the fact that you yep. can you can talk to somebody how if you were in person rest the fuck assured you would not talk to them that way cuz you'd be held accountable yep. for your fucking mouth. And, and because of that, I mean, I don't give a shit what any you know, beta fucking bleeding heart asshole wants to say that the reality of of human nature is violence is the gold fucking standard and and if you disrespect somebody enough to their face, you're going to be held accountable for it. And, and the fact that there is a, a vacuum of that in our society now, and, and, it's, and it just compounds on itself over and over, I think it makes it very easy for, you know, I'll use Soros as an example because it, it gets amplified, but people like him, Koch brothers on the other side, same fucking thing, is that they have a, a much more uh, ability in terms of power and influence to be able to divide people and to piss them off and to manipulate their emotions and, and make them to, to seem angrier than they actually are about things. but Well, the problem, Mike, that you're hinting at there is that you just did that thing of the same thing on the other side because you don't want to be seen as accusing you know one side of something that both sides do. And you're absolutely right. The difference is that whatever someone on the left wants to... Uh, whatever message they want to put out there, however they want to influence people, they have a much bigger, louder megaphone mm-hmm. than people on the other side. For sure. That's, and that changes the game entirely, yeah. right? And, com- and completely. So what social media has, has done is, in one sense, it was supposed to have given us more freedom and more, made us you know, more powerful and given us access to more knowledge and information than uh, any other time in history. And, and on the other side... In fact, what it's done is silence more people, right? You only have to look at the last election to see that. Social media and the media and these made it uh, a terrible, terrible thing for anyone to stand up in public and say they supported Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. So most people lied about it. So if there were any polls that were actually looking for the truth and not trying to, um, you know, try, not trying to substantiate a, a, a pre-desired an outcome that they intended to get no matter what, yeah. if there were polls who were actually asking people uh, honest questions, wanting an honest answer, they didn't get one a lot of the time because you'd have to be suicidal to stand up in public and say you supported Donald Trump, right? I mean, that was akin to walking with the devil mm-hmm. and being one of the, Worst people on earth. I think, yeah. what did Hillary call it? A 
deplorable, yeah, right? Yeah. You jump right in the basket. Yeah. Who wants to be in that basket, right? Yeah. That's embarrassing. Um, nobody wants to be in that basket. So um, that's what I, what I find that causes me a lot of concern is that information now has become a uh, much more powerful weapon. It was always powerful. The pen has always been mightier than the sword. But with the rise of social media and the, and the cover it gives people, you don't know if any of these people writing on any of these websites are really outraged, you know, people driven by their conscience standing up for what's right. They could be paid political propagandists. They could be um, ideologically um, part of uh, an organization and an organized movement. Um, they could be an algorithm for all you know, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we think things go viral because everybody loves them. No, things go viral because YouTube has people on their staff who write the algorithms that push those things forward mm -hmm. to be in a position where they can go viral, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, without that, yeah. ask someone from YouTube what the chances are that your stuff really goes viral. That's, you know, mm -hmm. that's an entirely different yeah. equation yeah. if you look at it like that. And, uh, and, Really, the disturbing part for me is also that we don't ask those questions. Like, there's, who's paying for it is one of the oldest questions in history. But we never ask that. When people show up um, to protest, right, to do a big mass protest, who paid for the buses? Who organized them? Mm -hmm. Who organized them? Who made it possible? Who provided um, the infrastructure to make all of that happen? These are very... Uh, significant questions, and I feel like we don't even ask them yeah. today. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, the, and it's you know, it's a discussion we could have for for days, frankly. But yes. um, you know, to me, like I said, I think ultimately it boils down to to just straight up accountability, and it starts with yourself. You know, and it yep. starts with whatever viewpoint that you tend to lean towards and, and et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, this is the kind of interview that could, is like professional suicide for me in many respects, right? Well, I'm happy, because... to, happy to be that guy for you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. But, it's my but pleasure. you know what I mean? It's, it's, no, I this is exactly what they target you for, well, is being honest yeah. like this and saying these kind of things. Yeah. Because it's not independent, honest voices that people are looking for. They, that's not, I mean, when I say people are looking for, yes, the average person out there wants that. But people who, um, who, have, who are very powerful in controlling the messages out yeah. there, um, they're not looking yeah. for that. And that's, you know, when you asked uh, before we even started, you know, why did you start the podcast? I mean, that that is, in essence, one of the primary motivating factors for that is that it, it does give, uh, you know, people like me and, and or us, uh, you know, with this viewpoint, a a platform and a medium of some some sort, uh, you know, and, and the, the neat thing about it is, you know, when you see how many people are, are listening to these episodes and and the comments and messages that we get is, you know, it's like, fuck, it's a, it's a breath of fresh air to hear people finally talk the way most of us actually feel, you know? And so, um, but you see, cause you don't have advertisers right. that can be targeted right. and shamed into abandoning sure. your program. Yeah. And, you know, you don't have a corporate master who's going Nobody. to fire you yeah. and right. And all yeah. of that, but then you're also not getting paid to do yeah. this, right? No, I'm not. I mean, I, I, but, but I answer to nobody, you know? And right. so, I mean, I do it cause I'm passionate about it. And there, I mean, there still is, you know, the ability to monetize things, but that's not why I do it. I, I do it right. because, because there's a vacuum as far as that goes. But, um, if we could uh, pivot to, to just one thing, because I know it's a it's a huge prominent event in your uh, in your life in your past, uh, both professionally and personally. If we if we could, uh, before we wrap up, talk about the uh, the incident in Egypt, if uh, if you feel comfortable talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, I know for the viewers listening, some of it, um, most of it's probably not a surprise. It was a, obviously a big thing in the news, but um, for me, knowing you at the time personally, and and that was when we met, just yeah. afterwards, right? When you showed up at my house with those ugly flowers. Well, and you're, again, you're welcome. <laughs> it's the best I could do. I uh, will say it wasn't just you, yeah. a complete stranger, yeah. showing up on yeah. my doorstep yeah. with flowers. No, yeah. they were... It's mutual it, friends, at least. It, some mutual friends were involved yeah. in that equation. Yeah. But, you know, I would love to get, uh, you know, just because I, I think it's important for people to hear... Uh, both the, the from a from an ideology standpoint, the enemy that we face, uh, some of the cultures and how different they are, and, and you know the experience that you went through, uh, you know if, if it can help help anybody out moving moving down down the road, I think uh, I think it's an important lesson. So, you know what happened to me 
um, I think is in fact is is a lot more about the last subject we were just talking about about information warfare than it is about you know, for example, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, right? Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's lots of overlap there, just starting with the fact that Hosni Mubarak in Egypt was probably um, one of the, I mean, definitely one of the most important, arguably the most important ally for the U.S. in the war on terror because um, the Egyptians were doing all the renditions, were doing renditions and interrogations and running black sites for the U.S. and um, Egyptians were able to infiltrate uh, Al Qaeda and that more easily than Americans, right? And so, so Egypt was a very, very, very close partner to the U.S., but not just in the war on terror. Egypt's been a close partner to the U.S. with Israel and you know, and for a long time in the Middle East. So, um, when when Mubarak was who had been in power for so long was at that moment when uh, with all the protests and the rise of social media, which gave, and the rise of 24-hour news, the existence of 24-hour news combined with uh, Facebook and Google and, and social media, um, looking at the power of that, that regime, which was on the brink of um, losing everything, right? Uh, they, they used some of the tactics that, quite frankly, you know, the kind of tactics that we have used too, that nations and countries all over the world do. So, uh, and then what they did was target journalists so that um, they could intimidate journalists into not coming to their country and, and uh, covering these events, which exposed them so much and, um, and at a moment when they had everything to lose. So in one sense, it wasn't personal. In another sense, I was personally selected because as a correspondent for 60 Minutes and as a woman, um, I, I fit the ideal description for them to get mass amount of attention and the, the nature of what they, the tactic they were using, you know, being uh, gang rape uh, was a tactic that's often effectively used against women. So that's kind of the political context for really what was happening. You know, for me, um, I had gone to Egypt to cover the so-called Arab Spring um, because it was a big deal. And having worked and lived in the Middle East and um, areas around it for a long time, I knew how significant it was that the power, balance of power was about to change in such a profound way. And, um, I, you know, like a lot of journalists, right? I wasn't the only one, but it was just a big, 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 big deal. And I'd been in Egypt before and, and worked there before. So when I went in... Um, the CBS News team were not that happy. You know, they didn't want someone from 60 Minutes coming in, bigfooting them. So I got shunted up to Alexandria. They got rid of me as fast as they could, and um, and went and I covered uh, I covered the whole uprising from Alexandria, which is the home, the birthplace of the Muslim Brotherhood. Right, and the U.S. had rendition ships parked in the harbor off the coast of Alexandria. So I didn't mind because it was an interesting place to be, and that's really what I care about. Um, but when I was off the clock for news and heading down to Cairo for 60 minutes, um, our team was stopped in some of the many, many checkpoints on the outskirts of the city. And the short version of that is that, after, you know, we, we spent, uh, I don't know, 18, 20 hours in Egyptian custody being um, interrogated and uh, one of our team uh, beaten, badly beaten, an Egyptian member of our team, a driver, um, I was very, very sick with dehydration and ended up unconscious in, um, uh, in one room of the cells with a very filthy old IV shoved into my arm. Stabbed, actually, is more like it. But anyway, so when we came out of that and made it out of that, um, we went to the airport and I came home. And that was really difficult for me because I knew Mubarak was still in power, but we knew it was the end and I wanted to be there. So I kind of waited until I was in the shower with my husband and, and, uh, <laughs> for obvious reasons yeah. and said, Oh, you know, so obviously I, st I need to go back <laughs> you to wish. Egypt. You do that while you're in the shower. <laughs> I still impressive. remember the yeah. exact conversation. And, you know, my, my husband and I share this passion for, for uh, showers. <laughs> no, I wasn't, well, not for showers, yeah. for, uh, for these 
for these subjects, yeah. right? He's driven by the same um, interests and things that I am. And so I knew, you know, I, I quickly turned the conversation to a discussion about the significance of the end of the Mubarak regime. And he was like, oh, yeah, you got to go back, you know? <laughs> so um, a week to the yeah. day later, yeah. I landed back in Cairo. And it's so funny because my producer, Max McClellan, is one of the greatest human beings and greatest producers ever to have lived. Um, he showed, I met him in the airport and, and he had a, a new sweater on. Well, one I didn't recognize, not new. I said, Max, you got a new sweater because I know everything in that man's wardrobe, right? There's only about six things. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we worked together for like 14 years. And um, Max said, no, sheepishly, you know, he's like, no, it's not new. He's like, um, my wife wouldn't let me wear the other one. And I was like, why? And he said, well, because, you know, when we were separated at the checkpoints and they finally hunted him down um, and threw him against a wall at another, uh, part, another part of the city, um, they uh, didn't have any handcuffs and they were looking for something to handcuff. No, they handcuffed him. They were looking for a blindfold. They didn't have anything to blindfold him with. And so he said, well, you can use my sweater if you want. <laughs> And he obviously told his wife this story yeah. and she was like so annoyed. She was like, no, 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 you're not wearing that. Yeah. If you're going back, you're not wearing that. So he dug something out of his old college wardrobe and he wore this old sweater. Anyway, um, 10 minutes after we landed in Cairo, we got the news that we were still in the airport. Mubarak had stepped down and all we wanted to do was to that night was get to the swear. That's all we wanted to do. And there were people in the streets everywhere. We stopped and filmed a little bit on the way, but then we got to the hotel you know, got our stuff together, sent part of the team, um, one place, part of the team, another place, and rushed to the square. And I had Richard Butler, the, the, my uh, colleague who was kidnapped in Iraq, um, and Somalia, and a few places. Um, and I had Max with me. And we went into the square. And honestly, it was like a big party. And, and it was... People were saying, thank you, Mark Zuckerberg. Thank you, Facebook. Thank you, Google. You, this is your revolution, all of that stuff. And, um, and it wasn't until Richard's camera light went out. But you got to know the Egyptians knew. I mean, they, you know, the Mokhabra, their intelligence organizations are extremely sophisticated and vast. So they knew the moment I landed. In fact, they knew before I landed that I was coming back. So the chances are that I was targeted, you know, maybe even before I got there. Yeah. Journalists were being, were being, you know, pushed around and some more severely than others, um, some running into other problems in the square. And it didn't help that the Egyptians had said that journalists were considered, you know, the enemy. Um, and there was just, it was just one moment like that when someone said something and someone else said something else. And I was oblivious because I didn't um, understand, Arab, those, you know, those sentences and phrases in Arabic and our young Egyptian Fixer turned around and looked at me with terror, and he was just literally white as a sheet. And he said, "We've got to run. We've got to run." And I don't argue with local guys, right? I mean, it's a time to argue, and that is not it. So I started running, and um, I thought that people in the crowd were um, trying to help us, and later realized that they weren't. That those guys locked onto me. And some of the people I thought were trying to help me were among those people trying to tear my clothes off and um, grabbing my breasts and, you know, and all of that. And it just, um, I got separated from the rest because the crowd, you know, the mob forced us uh, to do that. I mean, they forced people away from me and they wanted to separate me. That was the whole purpose. And the only per person that I was holding on to was Ray Jackson, our security guy, who... Um, hadn't been with us the week before when we were in, uh, arrested. He, was, he had come with us. We did that to sort of keep CBS happy and make them think that we were you know, taking extra security precautions and all that. And uh, I had Ray, he, he screamed at me to hold on to him and I grabbed the front of his shirt, the collar, and I didn't let go until they tore him off me. And the whole time in the beginning for at least the first 20 minutes or so, Ray was able to tell me what was happening. I guess he saw uh, I saw more than anybody, but it was very hard to see everything because I was buried under a sea of men. And of course they were, you know, I felt people putting their hands between my legs and all this. And I was like trying to push them away and thinking, 
it, it almost took me a moment really to realize, wow, like, because you've been in a crowd before, people have touched you inappropriately or whatever, but it's, it became apparent that this was very different and somewhat overwhelming. And I don't know like how much um, detail you can stand, but you know, piece by piece, they tore all my clothing off and just, and really would tore my body almost to pieces and s tore my insides apart. What, uh, is there an element of consciousness that, that was lost at that point? I mean, were you... Sadly, no. I mean, you were... No, in fact, I was um, conscious of everything, every little thing. I mean, I don't relive all of it. Some there are, I guess there are kind of gaps in my memory. I don't really see them as gaps. It's just things that are not there in all the detail, but I still remember them happening. I had, it was like I was living um, follow, on two tracks the entire time. So one track is going really, really, really slowly where you're uh, conscious of every little thing and you're having a whole conversation with yourself and you're seeing things. I saw people taking pictures. I remember the one guy whose face I bit. Um, I was conscious of the feeling of the air on my skin because the night air was kind of cool. And I could feel that. I remember feeling when, I remember the sound of the, my bra strap snapping. I remember the sound of my necklace breaking. I remember, I remember fighting, being raped and being able to sometimes push people away. And then I remember just realizing that I was, there were too many of them and that um, it was over and over and over and over again, and that there was always someone else when you could fight one person and there was always somebody else. And I, rem I, I felt no pain. I will tell you that, I felt no pain. Ray was saying, they're beating us with sticks, they're beating us with flagpoles, they're doing this to us, they're doing that to us. I do remember thinking, wow, they're literally going to tear this skin from my skull. Like it's not, someone's trying to pull your hair. I remember thinking, they're trying to tear my, my scalp away. And they're trying to scalp me. And um, being conscious of all those details. And I remember being very humiliated. And uh, it was very, that even psychologically and emotionally painful, the humiliation of rape was very painful, even in that moment. But at the same time, I'm having, you know, everything is going so fast. And before I know it, I can hardly breathe. And the weight of all these men on my body um, is overwhelming me. And uh, when I lost Ray, it was really a terrible moment because I felt all the life drain from my body, my strength really drained from my body and I thought oh my god like this is it right I mean I'd like to tell you that you're spared the nastiness of it all but I wasn't I was very aware of how filthy it was and um and it was very uh and I knew that this was a filthy meaningless death on a dirty street in the worst possible way. And so when I lost Ray, I had that moment of clarity that I had no longer had the strength in my body to fight. And I had on my own no chance of survival. And I thought about my children. Did you, at that point, were you convinced that you weren't gonna, you weren't gonna survive it? I knew I had to stop fighting the sexual assault and the sexual part of it and fighting, you know, I really was trying to, in a way, fighting for my dignity and fighting to prevent that from happening. And I, I, I realized, I knew my, I faced the fact that my, I had no dignity left. I mean, you're naked in a crowd and people have your body, right? And you're being raped and sodomized. I mean, it's like, there's no, there's no dignity left in that. So, um, and I was, um, I was really dying because I couldn't breathe properly anymore. And uh, 
I had very little strength left. So um, I thought, wow, you have to save that strength and fight for your life now because what you're, what you're clinging to is gone. And um, when I lost Ray and thought about my children, I, was, I, I had given up. And it was fleeting. That's the fast part, right? It was literally just a moment. Um, but I thought, I'm not going to do that to them. How could I actually, what I really thought, because I remember this with absolute clarity, was I thought was, how could you do that to them? How could you give up? And uh, Lola was 10 months old at that time. And Joe was a year and two months older than her. So, you know, he was... Um, one, almost two, I guess. I don't know. Yes, and not almost two. Um, a year and oh, it must have just turned two. And so I did think very consciously, I'm not going to do that to them. I'm going to fight to the end so that um, when they read about this or when they learn about it when they're older, they will know that I died fighting. And... Um, I guess if there's one thing I'm kind of proud of, I'm proud that my instinct in that moment was the one I would have, I would have made the same decision if I had all the time in the world. I would die fighting. Because when you make that decision, it's very powerful in the sense of your own power. Because you have no, you know, in one to everyone else, you're completely powerless, right? I mean, I'm heading for death, and um, I have no ability to change that equation in that moment. But I, but the one thing I can have some say in is how I die, right? Mm -hmm. What that says about me as a person, and I, and instinctively, I knew that that one thing I could give my children was to know that I died fighting. It wouldn't be much, not like having a mother growing up, right? Yeah. But it's better than, but it's something it's about who I am. Living. That's in my words yeah. about who I am. And then, you know, I, the lot, Ray kept screaming at me, stay on your feet, stay on your feet, because of course I couldn't stay upright all the time. And I um, was very grateful that I had a good strong pair of boots on every time I was fighting to get up. And, um, I knew if I laid down that it was over, right, I would be dead. So um, the last time I went down, I didn't have the strength to get up anymore. And I was sort of dragged. Um, and there was just one part of the square where women and children had been camped and were living. And really, I think the Egyptian men and young men and boys that jumped up and put themselves between the women and the mob, they did that as much to protect their own as for me, hmm. I mean, I think it was for both. I'm not sure they would have done it just for me, yeah. but it doesn't really matter. What was hard for me in that moment was that suddenly there was space between me and certain death. Suddenly there was space between me and just the air alone. You know, you can't breathe in that air. Um, and it was a chance that I could actually live. And I was so afraid that they were just going to reach back and drag me back into that mob. And I thought initially that when Ray was taken from me, that that was the moment, you know, that signed my death warrant. But I actually worked, it took, would you believe it, it took me at least three years or so to realize that Ray was the one who went and got the army to come and find me. Really? And if he hadn't forced the army to do that, they weren't going to do anything. Do you know uh, from the time that, that it started until, do you know how long that process was? I was told that it was just over 40 minutes. I have to say, though, I've never really believed that, that it, because it, to me, it felt um, much longer. I would, I would have said it was over an hour. Yeah. But who knows? I'll never be able to prove that. Yeah. So was that kind of the saving grace then as Ray got the army, they came back? And yes, because got... they beat their way. They took batons and they beat their way through the mob. And um, there was no other way through that mob. You know what I mean? It mm -hmm. wasn't, um, and they weren't going to open fire on their own people or anything like that. They weren't going to fire into the air. I mean, they, you know, ma b batons are maybe we make it through, maybe yeah. we don't, right? Yeah. Like we'll see how much effort we're going to put into this. Yeah. And when they got to me, finally, they uh, wouldn't touch me. Yeah. Because I was naked. I mean, my 
pants and my, my boots were still on. So my pants were stuck around my ankles, but um, they were shredded, right? I mean, they, they tore everything apart, including, by the way, you know, like my skin, I could see. I had marks for a long time afterwards with, where hands had been, where they were trying to tear my breasts off my body, where you could see their fingers, but they was etched in blood deep um, in my skin. So um, it took a long time to go away. Um, but people were throwing things at me in the crowd, like items of clothing. And um, eventually the women were pouring water down my throat to help me breathe and all of that. And eventually the soldiers came back with a shador and traditional black robes and put that over me. And then they picked me up and carried me while other soldiers still had to beat their way through that mop. Right. I mean, I, I was clinging to that soldier. Like I can't even describe it to you because the, the, the thought that that chance to live would be taken from me mm-hmm. was more terrifying at that point even than being raped. I just couldn't stand. Yeah. I couldn't, I just thought, I can't do it again. Yeah. I can't do it again. Like, I made it this far, but I won't make it this far again. Yeah. If they take me back, that was unimaginable to me at that point. That was just like the worst thing that I could possibly think of at that point yeah. was that I had that chance and I was so afraid that it was going to be taken from me. Yeah. From, from that point when, uh, once you recovered and, and removed from the mob, what, what was that timeline like from, from then? Like, did they treat you at a hospital there? Did they get you on a plane? I had a doctor come to my hotel room, but you know, I, um, our Egyptian driver who had been beaten, he came to the soldiers with his arms out. I remember seeing him. And he took me in his arms and he walked me up this little alleyway off the side of the square. And Max and, and Richard and everybody was waiting for me. And I remember Max just fell down on the ground at my feet. And he just kept saying, I'm so sorry. And I just kept saying, Max, you know, you can't believe what they did to me. Yeah. You can't imagine what they did to me. But I, and um, I realized nobody knew, they couldn't see, you know, because I was covered in those, in those black robes. And so um, they, the Egyptian army wanted us to walk back to the hotel and we'd walk to there and we had no vehicle and we wouldn't, you know, they obviously they wouldn't do that because we were afraid. You know, there's, a, there's millions of people between us and the hotel. And uh, obviously not all of them were, uh, in a good mood, mm-hmm. <laughs> let's say. So they brought a small Egyptian military vehicle and we piled into the back. And as we started to take off, I remember seeing our Egyptian fixer and uh, this young man who had been with me, you know, and he was such a lovely man. And he just started vomiting onto the ground. And I screamed, screamed at this point. And we, um, I said, we're not leaving him. We're not leaving him. And we grabbed him. We just pulled him into the back and he lay on top of us, his tiny little military jeep kind of thing. And um, the doctor that night at the hotel, just, I wanted to talk to him because nobody wanted to talk to me. Nobody wanted to look at me. Nobody knew how to look at me. It wasn't, you know, that any, nobody cared. It was that, as Max and Jeff said to me, because I, I uh, made them sleep with me that night in the hotel and they slept on the floor and I was still so scared, you know, is that my dog? Yeah. Rose, you bad dog. Come here, Rosie. Sit down. Come on, sit down. Um, damn, this one. We want to get this. We got the door, we got the dog, we got everything going on. Hold on one second. Sure. I'm so sorry. I think Renee, will you grab her for me, please? Thank you. She's fine. She won't move because she's so afraid. I'm going to make her uh, go outside. I can put my lipstick on. Inside. Um, Rosie, stay. Stay there, okay? Stay there, bad dog. Sit. What's up? Oh, sorry. Oh. Sit. Sit. So, um, Rose. Stay. Out. Look, that'll, look, that'll make her sit more than anything. Rose. 
Okay, stay. Done. Don't move. So, um, the doctor at the hotel didn't, wanna, didn't want me to talk. And nobody knew what to do. You know, I made, I made Jeff and Max uh, sleep with me, but they lay on the floor. And um, I just remember being so scared. And I didn't want to make them lie in the bed with me. I didn't even know what to say. But um, they didn't want to violate, make me feel more violated than I already did. You know, they didn't know what to do. I, and, uh, and that's how it was with everybody. No one really knows what to do in that situation. It's not their fault. Yeah. But I realized sitting in that hotel room when my boss was calling, asking what was, you know, how we were going to still get the story done. And, my, and Max is sitting on my bed talking about, you know, the shoot. I realized at that moment that they have no idea what really happened. Yeah. Rose, you're going out. I gave you a chance and you blew it. Come on. Okay, wait. Nothing like food to get it done. Do what you want. Get your treats. See, my husband throws her out. Okay. But a dog is, you know, even when she really wants to be inside, she can't say no to the bacon bits. Come on, Rosie. Okay. Get one that's not even open. Shit, Rose, I'm gonna kill you. I don't know. Wait. I can just pick her up if you want. No. <laughs> Watch this. This one. Hold on. So, Mike, yeah. come on, you're the big dog guy. I mean, I would just pick her up. That's what I would do. <laughs> do you pick her up? I would do this. You want to, if, okay, I mean, pick her up. And I'll still put her treats out here for her. She's not, uh, she's not light, by the way. No, no, I, I tore my tricep. I can't feel her now. Oh. I know. I'm getting old. <laughs> I just tease it. She's very heavy. Look, she's doing all her tricks too. Yeah. Sorry, Rosie. I'm trying to be sweet. <laughs> <laughs> That's priceless. Rose. I'll get rid of the door. There we go. Thank you. Me and my broken fucking chicken wing. Uh, my dog likes to be inside. She, yeah. she makes her moments, right? She's got a good time. And... All right, so. Um, good? Can I get you to move in just a little oh, yeah. closer? Me or her? Uh, Either? Yeah. Both? Up. Up. We're in. All right, so um, at, at this point, um, your your head shed at the at the network doesn't doesn't even really know what happened. Yes, um, so you know when someone's leg is blown off or they're shot or you know they're blown up or something like that, everybody has a, an instant understanding of it. But um, so one of my first realizations in the square that night was that um, of, of how distinct sexual violence is because you, first of all, no one wants to talk about it. It's hard to find the words. It's kind of embarrassing even and um, uncomfortable, makes everyone uncomfortable and it's not visible, right? I'm not gonna take my clothes off and show you like all the, my bruises and wounds and everything else. Mm -hmm. So um, when I heard Max having that conversation, I, I waited for him to get off and I said to him, Max, I need you to do something for me. I said, I need you 
to get everybody out of the room and then get my husband on the phone. And I called, uh, I told my husband, I said, I'm, I want to tell you everything they did to me and I need you to listen. And when I'm done, I want you to pick up the phone and call my boss because I, I couldn't tell him those things. It's too hard. And um, my husband is trained, you know. I mean, he was in the Army for 23 years. And in the part where he worked, none of this surprised him. So um, I did, and he did that. And after that, everything kind of changed, you know. Not that um, people understood it, but my boss understood it. And so um, we flew back the next day, and I went straight to hospital back to Colonel Mike Dietz, a friend of ours, and my husband, they met me at the airport and took me straight to the hospital and I stayed there. But that was a sort of another form of torture for me because my daughter took her first steps mm. at home and I missed it, I was in the hospital. So um, I just wanted to get home, yeah. you know? And there's nothing they could do for the internal injuries anyway. And um, unfortunately I have a lot of scarring and uh, Recovery is long, you know, you're never free, right? Everything yeah. has a price. So I got to live, but there was a price, which is okay. It's a price I'm happy to pay. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's two things. I mean, one, hearing, hearing that story and having been to, you know, a lot of countries where the predominant culture is accepting, uh, accepting of things like that and, and whatever, it, uh, it's hard not to be violently fucking angry you know he hearing that as as being a friend but of Mike, yours and i just want you to know though in egypt i didn't know at the time so many women are subject to oh, sexual no. violence and it's a form of control because if women know that if they go out of the house on their own they're not safe well what do they do they yeah, always they have make sure they have a man with them or they so if they leave. don't have a man with them they don't go. Yeah. So it's a it's a form of, of social control. And um, so many Egyptians over the years, and even today now, um, when I go, when I speak at different places or meet people, so many, if there's an Egyptian there who uh, realizes, you know, that I'm this person that this happened to in Egypt, they always come to me, men and women, and tell me, I'm so sorry. And they're very, you know, very moved and pained that this happened in their country. And they always apologize on behalf of Egypt. And I always tell them not that they don't have to do that, you know. I mean, you and I know that bad. Things happen to good people everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, people are raped in this country, right? Mm -hmm. People are gang raped in this country. Um, and certainly in South Africa, I saw mobs chop people up and you know, and, and set them on fire. So it's not like um, it's different from what I grew up with in South Africa at the end of apartheid. There was a rape every 22 seconds, right? And many of those rapes were babies, let alone children. So it, is, it isn't completely separate from the culture, um, but it's not, uh, I don't blame the culture in the place. This was a very strategic attack. It's, um, you know, people in the crowd were saying, let's take her clothes off, let's do this, let's do that. And that was the spark that was needed for bad people to take that and run with it. Yeah. And in that mob situation, it went off the charts. There are good people in Egypt and there are, are bad people. You know, I got to tell you something. I have, I've never, ever been angry. Um, I never thought about revenge I never thought even about justice, maybe because, I mean, I, you know, obviously I, I, would, I would think it was appropriate if people who were guilty of that were held to account. And I, and I think that would be most important for all the other people, mm -hmm. right? That would be spared because of that. It's yeah. not going to change anything for me. Yeah. The most powerful thing I ever heard in my life. <laughs> Dad, yeah. come on. My son's going to his Spanish lesson. But the most powerful, one of the most powerful things I ever heard in my life from a woman who was raped in South Africa and, um, and almost killed. I mean, they slit her open and slit her throat, right? She's a, it was a miracle that she survived. And she's uh, one of the most unbelievable women you could ever 
imagine, right, that people like that even exist. But she, I learned something from her at her trial when, they asked, when she was asked how she managed to recover and um, be so strong and because her testimony got these guys arrested. Her description in the emergency room got those guys arrested. And, um, and she said, you know, they took so much from me that night. Why would I give them the rest of my life? as well. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that's kept me strong. You know, the initial thing is one part of the recovery, but really the much harder thing is the long term, yeah. making your peace with it and living with it. And you're under this pressure. I was under tremendous pressure, I think, especially professionally, to prove to everybody that I was the same person that I was before this happened to me, or that I hadn't completely lost my mind, or that I was still capable of doing my job and, and all of that. And, um, and also not to talk about it because if you talk about it, it's a sign that you're not over it, mm -hmm. right? If you mention it, then you're, um, you know, then you somehow are uh, not whole. Um, erasing it is the sign of, that you are uh, recovered. Well, that's ridiculous. You don't ever erase the things that happen to you. Yeah. You know, no one asks you to grow your leg back, yeah. right? So um, for me, Alison, this, her words at that trial where she said, why would I give them the rest of my life as well? That's what I live by. Yeah. Why would I give them any more of me than I have to? Huh. And, uh, and I don't, there are moments where it's, uh, harder than I would like it to be. And there are times where I am, where I'm reminded, not so much the physical sexual things, more as like if my husband pushes me, you know, and um, that can trigger that feeling, uh, that feeling when I'm being forced against my will and I can't stop it. Um, and you know, I just tell him and it usually works, mm -hmm. usually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but um, but the hard, you know, the, the harder thing is just is um, getting people to understand that you can heal and you can be whole yeah. without being um, unaffected. Yeah. And for me, I uh, physically, physically, the effects on my body have been in some ways harder to live with yeah. than psychologically. Yeah, has the uh, the psychological aspect has that. Um, affected the the relationship with with your husband, or I mean, is there? It's hard for me to to think that it wouldn't to a certain extent. You know, um, he kicked into professional mode, um, especially in the beginning. You know, and dealt thing. I think sort of compartmentalized it and didn't really deal with it. And I think for a long time, I didn't I didn't um, fully understand or pay much attention to how it affected him. That sounds kind of selfish, but mostly because he didn't show it. Mm -hmm. um, and because he's sort of not your average guy, right? Your average guy couldn't hear the gory details of what happened to his wife um, from her in that moment. I mean, be so because of that, I think um, I sort of underestimated how much it affected him. Yeah. Um, more than didn't pay attention to it. And um, it, a year later, I got breast cancer, and uh, that could have killed me as well, you know. So over time, it kind of came out with him that he became more uh, protective and obviously more, uh, and that for me is more restrictive. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and I remember once it all sort of going up in flames in an argument and where he said, like, I've, you know, like, for God's sake, you've almost, I've almost lost you twice. I don't want to lose you again. And that was the beginning of my sort of realizing, wow, he's not okay with all of this. He hasn't dealt with it. Yeah. Um, so it, it affected us a lot in that way, I think. Yeah. Um, but I will say, I mean, two weeks later, he was still, he was already badgering me to have sex with him. And I was like, <laughs> like crying on a bucket. I just, you know, it was damn rape only buys me two weeks. <laughs> and you're nagging me, and then we started laughing, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know how many couples could yeah. have that conversation. Yeah. Well, maybe it's the uh, it's the shower mechanism. Did he did he 
<laughs> so that's your guys. Yeah, you said I know it'll make you feel better, sa- honey. How about a let's shower? Jump, let's jump in the shower. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Well, I mean, for me, it, it's uh, I know it's a tough thing to, to talk about. I, I appreciate. It. I know the listeners will appreciate uh, your your willingness to to open up and share that story, and it, it's an important, powerful one that I know a lot of women uh, internationally have have dealt with, and so uh, I appreciate you you telling us about it. Um, I, I would like to ask now at this point, as, as we come, come to a close is what, uh, what now for, uh, for you, uh, professionally, personally, what, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know, to be honest with you. I mean, right now I'm a mom and I'm still working, of course. And journalism is always, you know, right up there, um, at the forefront of everything important to me, but, um, I'm a little disillusioned by the state of things and so that makes it harder and i'm consumed with um being there for my children i really i really love being with my kids you know i mean that's the best time that i can have and i'm very conscious of every day with them i mean when i travel now i don't just disappear and go off to baghdad for five years or stay in Kabul for a year or, you know, all that kind of stuff. I have to really limit myself. And the hardest part is that, you know, I went to Liberia at the height of the Ebola epidemic to a frontline treatment center and then into quarantine. And doing those things now when my children can look at me and say, Mom, because I embedded with the Taliban once and I may have been having some conversations recently. And my son overheard some of that and looked at me and said, is that... Is that now or before? You know, mom, mom, yeah. is that now or before? And I was like, oh, that's, that's before, sweetheart, you know, kind of like guilty yeah. court. Um, so I don't even know now whether I can do that or yeah. not, you know? And that particular instance is somewhat extreme, right? Sure. But, um, but that would be the kind of thing that I would do because... Yeah. Because I don't want to just do what everyone else is doing, and also because it's really important yeah. to me to to talk to them in this moment and understand where they are as the U.S. negotiates its surrender yeah. from Afghanistan without the job being done. Yeah. Um, and the job, I mean, the the goal of uh, defeating Al Qaeda yeah. after nine eleven, since they're not defeated, right? Yeah. Um, but so I'm always going to do what I believe in mm-hmm. always so that's not over for me and i am working with a, an amazing production company out of montana um to try to do a series um about the wars but i've got a lot of other stuff yeah. um going on as well and um mostly the most important thing to me now is um being the best mom i can be while i have the chance because yeah. no matter how you know, worthy or important, I might think um, what I'm doing is, it doesn't mean anything to anyone, com- like what it means to my kids to have me there yeah. in the night when they wake up, you know, or, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and I know that's the most important thing for yeah. me to do right. There, there will always be stories. There won't always be, uh, you know, kids in elementary school running around. So. And even if they're not just stories to me, which, you know, very yeah. few of them are, um, even then, right? I mean, sometimes you do miss out and sure. you don't get it back. I it was always the girl who said you could have everything. And what I realize now is that you can have everything. You just might not be able to have it all at the same time. Yeah. And everything, that definition of everything changes because yeah. I've had the career and I have the family and I have, I still have the career, but, um, my career from a small town in Texas, when I cut back from my work at 60 minutes by 70%, is not the same as my career when I was um, in, uh, on, the West, on the East Coast, right? Yeah. Consume, going, traveling to five different states yeah. in one week and two continents. Yeah. Forget it, right? Yeah. It's not. Fly, flying me out and, and back on one day to, to put a, a three-minute segment into an interview. Uh, yeah, I mean, to do stuff like that, obviously, you yeah. got to be... That's there. crazy. Yeah, yeah, you're working at a crazy level. Yeah. That's just yeah. something else entirely. So if that's what matters to you, and it's really important, you can have children and have yeah. someone else raise them for you because yeah. you're not going to be present, right? Because yeah. that's impossible. Yeah. But then, for me, what I realized was, wow, 
I can do that, but then I'm not going to be able to be the mother I want to be. Yeah. Like, so something has to give. Everything has a price. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, uh, I mean, I love that, that you prioritize it. That I know what I'm going to do. Sorry. I'm going to have a margarita. <laughs> All right. And some, and some good food yeah. at my favorite place right. on Main Street. Well, hell yes. I'm taking you to Hondo's on Main. Well, it, uh, it's about to get fucking real here in a minute, folks. So. <laughs> Margaritas and uh, God knows what else. Um, w- one thing that, as you've told me these stories, and I knew you know glimpses of some of them, but certainly not to the, the depth and detail with which you've, you've shared with us today. Have you thought about writing a book? I know, I know it would be... 4,000 fucking pages long, but uh, <laughs> I mean, honestly, like uh, there should be a book and a movie or when you talk about a series, like there should be a, a mini series of your life, I think, like with, with the stories you've been through, it, it, it baffles me that you haven't written one. Everybody asks that. Um, I, I, get, I mean, honestly, I get asked that all the time and I, I'm, I know I will. It's just, um, I really like to tell you, I like, I like to tell people everything. Yeah. You know, and all the stuff that happened. And yeah. some of that stuff is kind of tricky if it gets out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I know I could do the book without all of that, yeah. but then it won't be as much fun. Yeah. And it won't be as real as me. It won't be the whole story. And it won't be the whole story. Yeah. And yeah. so I, own, I've, I told you the idea of uh, leaving it for my kids to publish after I'm dead yeah. and all the ma- people who are mad at me um, <laughs> will not be able to yell at me. Yeah. Uh, well, they can yell at my uh, at my grave. No, I don't want to. I want to be cremated. By the way, just in case you ever hear that someone's yeah. burying me, right. you can step in on my I behalf will. and say, "You know, she never wanted to be in a yeah. box with insects eating her yeah. body. I want to be. Yeah. I want to melt into the ocean somewhere." Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I yes, I mean, I'm definitely will write, and I think I'll. I know I'm going to write more than one book, but I'm not really sure I want to do the like the autobiography kind of thing. I yeah. I sort of want to do it a little. Maybe a little differently, you know, write it yeah. in another way. Yeah. And I'm trying to figure that out. But I'm also trying to figure out how do I really want, how much of me do I want to give to everybody? Because there's lots of amazing people out there, but there's, yeah. you know, some people are not going to take it as it's intended. Yeah. And what are the consequences of that? What's the price of that? Yeah. But at the same time, I know um, you're not given this life just for you, yeah. right? It's not just for me. I didn't get lucky just for me. Um, it's it, it. My story doesn't just belong to me, in a sense. None of our stories do. So if there's something in your story, and I know there is in mine because of the people that have told that to me in very powerful ways, if something of me belongs to people who need it, um, then I, I owe them, yeah. right? So I know I'll do it. But I'm not going to be doing it when I'm up at seven o'clock making yeah. breakfast and, <laughs> and bacon, you know, collapsing in bed at night during the homework. Yeah. I think that's yeah. it's going to come slowly. I have written parts of it actually, yeah. Yeah. but um, fragments, yeah. I would say, more than chapters, yeah. right? Yeah. I've written fragments of it. Yeah, well, that's good. I know. Uh... And also, wait, I want to say one thing before you go. So, so it's like um, people might wonder, well, how could she talk about? Uh, about Egypt like that as if it's like nothing, you know? Um, the thing is, it's you. And I know that um, that makes it easier and harder in some ways. It's easier because I know that you're asking me for all the right reasons, but it makes it harder because I know how much you care. Yeah. And so I just, um, this is not the average podcast for me because yeah. I know... I know who you are, yeah. and um, and that means a lot to me. And um, and you drove halfway across the country <laughs> to <laughs> yeah. my door when yeah. that happened to me, right? So we go right back to that moment, yeah. you and I. Yeah. And um, and you know I care a lot about you, so I just um, I never had that conversation like that in person with um, someone I care about. Yeah, I, uh, for me it, it was. Um you know, it was, it was hard to hear, and and you and know, I spared you the gory details. I know. Uh, even still, you know, knowing knowing what uh, what all in, is encompassed in that that experience, it uh, it is. It's hard to hear, but um, you know, to me, to to not hear it and to not understand, uh, you know, denies some of the the fact that it happened. I think, and, and I think it's important to to know about it and 
And again, I can't can't thank you enough for sharing it and and being willing to to sit down and be this open and honest with with me with with uh, you know the the um, the listenership, if you will, that I have. And and uh, I know that they'll they'll love the story and and really appreciate uh, you sharing it with them. So um, I, I I cannot thank you enough for doing that. I appreciate it very much. It's like I said to you when you asked me to do this interview. I'd never say no to you. Mike. Yeah, well, I appreciate it very much. It means means the world to all of us. So uh, thank you. And um, is there anything you want to want to share? Well, I just or, didn't know you were going to deny me food for yeah, this long. Yeah, well, it's again, it's uh, it's my pleasure. You're welcome. <laughs> it seems to be a recurring theme: shitty flowers and no food. But uh, <laughs> that might be the story yeah, of all of your yeah, relationships, uh, right? Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe that. Yeah, that's uh, there, maybe there is a recurring theme. I don't know. Um, I appreciate uh, everything that you've shared with us today, uh, opening up your home to, to me and the team to, to be able to conduct this. Your family's beautiful. The property is amazing. Um, and uh, I can't, again, I can't thank you enough for sharing. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Mike. Uh, for all you out there, I hope that, uh, that you got something out of this podcast. I know that you did. Um, and I know that you're as appreciative as I am uh, to have these stories shared. Um, you know, take uh, take a few moments to digest uh, everything that you've heard on this episode, and and take it to heart, uh, and put it to good use uh, in in any aspect that you can apply it to your life. Um, I cannot thank you guys, the the listeners, enough for the support that you continue to show uh, both me and, and the team that, that produces this this show because it is a team effort, um, and they they work their ass off on it. I show up and flap my gums. So um, thank you to them. Thank you to you guys. I appreciate you. We'll see you next time. And until that next time, this is Mike Drop.